Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today for World Horse Welfare's annual conference. My name is Neil Hudson. I'm the Member of Parliament for Penrith and the Border, and I'm also uh, an equine veterinary surgeon, and I'm the only vet in the House of Commons, and I'm very privileged to serve on the Environment, uh, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee. So the topic of today's conference is very close to my heart. This is truly a hybrid event, with guests here in London at the Royal Geographical Society, but also hundreds of guests who are attending virtually. Welcome to everyone here in the room, and welcome to all of you tuning in across the UK and right across the world. We are also offering guests online the opportunity to listen to today's event in Spanish or French. If you wish to do so, please simply follow the instructions at worldhorsewelfare.org forward slash conference, or here on this slide, hopefully. Or just go to the website. <laughs> To make sure our in-person and virtual guests can participate in discussion, we'll be taking questions from you here in the auditorium, as well as through Slido, uh, through the Q&A function on the Slido screen. You will have received the Slido link and passcode in your email invitations. And for those of you in the theater today, you have a choice. You can simply raise your hand to alert a member of the team to come with a microphone, or submit your question using the Slido app on your phone. What I will do when I'm taking questions, I'll probably alternate between Slido and people in the auditorium. So you can log in with the passcode on your printed program and include it on the slide here. Again, you have a choice. For those of you on YouTube, please do post any questions you have on YouTube, and we'll try to get to them as best we can. The discussion will also be taking place on Twitter, now known as X, using the hashtag, hashtag carbon hoofprint. I hope you'll all join in on the conversation, but for those of us in the theatre, do please remember to have your mobile phone on silent. Today we are considering whether horses are a friend or a foe of the environment. This question is sure to generate some soul searching, some surprising truths, and hopefully some inspiration as well. To get us started, we would like your views, so could you please complete the first poll? You'll need to click on the poll tab in Slido in the top right-hand corner. So the question one is, are horses more of a friend or foe of the environment? And you should have some options there, more friend, more foe, or neutral. So while you are voting, while you consider that, let me say how grateful we are at once again to the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust for their continued sponsorship of today's event. I'd also like to draw the attention of our guests in the theatre today to a few points for your security, health and safety. The current terror threat is substantial, two levels down from the most serious but still significant, so we have security precautions in place to ensure we keep everybody safe. So do sh make sure that you wear your name badge and ensure that it is visible at all times. In case of fire, the alarm will sound and you should leave the building. Every entrance and exit to the theatre is clearly marked as a fire exit. Once out of the theatre, guests should make their way to the nearest exit on street level. The fire meeting point is in front of the Royal Albert Hall, so everyone should make their way to this point and wait for further instructions. The charity will have fire marshals to assist RGS staff and help you point you in the right direction. In terms of first aid, several members of RGS staff are fully first aid trained. If a first aid emergency occurs, then please inform reception immediately. A first aid room is facing the cloakroom next to the female toilets. So now getting on to lighter things now. During the morning break, our virtual audience will be treated to three presentations exploring the theme of horses and the environment through the lens of World Horse Welfare's own work. And we are also grateful to you for your support. And for those in the room today, I'd like to draw your attention to the QR code within your printed program and around the conference today to donate to World Horse Welfare's work helping the horse-owning communities grappling with climate change in Senegal. Please do give generously if you can. Also, we are auctioning a hamper of international goods at the conference as well. 
Finally, I'd like to reiterate our thanks to our generous conference sponsor, the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust, for continuing to help make this event possible, as well as the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and Equine Register for their support. We are now privileged to have a message from Nigel Payne, MBE, trustee of the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust, to open this event. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute delight to once again support the World Horse Welfare Annual Conference, which has become so significant in the equine calendar. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you today in person, but uh, for those of you who know, the south of England, Bodmin Moor, is a very long way from anywhere. Associating Sir Peter with the World Horse Welfare Conference is absolutely appropriate. And the conference is a perfect match for the trust Peter was a great supporter of World Horse Welfare. And since the trust commenced in 1998, every year we have been able to financially support the wonderful work that you do. From a personal perspective, I've known Roly for a very long time. Uh, we've had a few uh, friendly jousts over situations regarding the Grand National, uh, which I was press officer for for 40 years. It usually concerned the number of runners. Rowley has got it his way because in the recent, uh, recent uh, analysis and report, the number of runners has been reduced. But the great thing about Rowley and World Horse Welfare and Aintree is that they, World Horse Welfare have always been very, very good listeners and very, very good at giving us advice and assisting with changes that are, after all, for the welfare of the, of the horse. Um, your theme today, Horses and the Environment, Friend or Foe, this is a very, very challenging and wide-reaching subject to discuss. I, I, I don't totally understand it, so I'm really looking forward to today's presentations and discussions. But what I do know from my own experience is that never could a horse be a foe. I relate this to one of my particular passions, and I know your Royal Highness, you also uh, support this, which is equine assisted therapy and what the horse can do to help people who are mentally ill or in total states of depression or fresh from battle in one of the terrible wars that might be going on, but what the horse can do and how the horse can help the human. But of course, this is a a marvellous thing as well because it gives the horse, particularly the tired thoroughbreds or even other, any other equine, a chance to have a new life and a new purpose. And that's the most wonderful thing. So this sounds to me as though it's going to be a very, very interesting day for you. And I wish you well. And uh, from the Peter S. Sullivan Trust, have a great day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nigel. I know everyone at this event is very grateful for the support. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Chairman of World Horse Welfare, Michael Baines. Your Royal Highness, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of World Horse Welfare, Welcome to this year's conference. Nigel, thank you, and a huge thanks to the Peter O'Sullivan Trust. We really couldn't ask for better support, and of course, the work they do, both for racing, for the animals, and for welfare, 
of, of the, the jockeys is, is outstanding and, and, and we welcome it. And my thanks also to our co-sponsors, uh, the Horse Race Levy Board and, of course, the Equine Register. Um, now, as those of you who attend this conference on a regular basis will know, um, we at World, for, World Horse Welfare are merely the conveners. Um, this, this conference is about improving equine welfare. It's not about us. However, as this is my last conference that I attend as chairman, um, and I know my chief exec's a bit worried about this, I hope you will indulge me just if I go off piece for a moment or two and to thank three people who've really been central to making sure uh, this conference becomes what it, what it is. Um, and, and most importantly, they're going to continue in their role long after I've gone. So starting at the top, um, we really cannot thank Her, Her Royal Highness enough for both attending this conference, and I think Ma'am, you've attended for at least 30 years, um, but long before any of us could remember. So, you know, it, it, it's a long time. And of course, you're not only president of our charity, but president of others. And if I may say so, an absolute champion influencer um, in the whole debate, as well as a, 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 an expert um, event rider in times gone past. Um, always leading by example, and always ready to show sound practical judgment when it's most needed. Uh, secondly, if I may, I'd like to thank Jessica Stark and her team for the effort they've made and whose selfless hard work as Director of Advocacy and Campaigning at the charity has done so much to ensure the success of this conference and how it's grown to be a real important event um, in, in our diary. Finally, nobody deserves more praise than my Chief Executive, Roly Owers who was CEO long before I was on the scene. Um, and that's a blessing for a chairman if he hasn't got to find one. Um, so thank you to my, my predecessor. And I hope we'll continue long after and for, for years to come. And I may say few things have given me more pleasure during my time as chairman than putting Rowley forward for an award and hearing that he had been honored at, with an OBE by His Majesty the King in recognition of his services to equine welfare. Rowley, well deserved. Congratulations. Now, to the subject matter for today. When I was strolling through the city yesterday, or rushing from one meeting to another, I was delayed by those eco-warriors just stop oil and had to make a bit of a detour. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what they would have thought if they'd been around 150 years ago or so um, and they'd been delayed by horses and they'd been smelling it, the streets. I sort of thought, hmm, do you think they'd have been saying, just stop Manil? Doesn't quite have the same cliche, the cachet, does it? And, and they probably wouldn't have been able to find any, any road to actually stick themselves to. Um, it just shows how central to human development horses have been. And of course, and it, luckily along came the in internal combustion engine to save the day. And then here we are now. Um, so horses in the environment, it's of course part of this wider debate about the environment and the human influence on it and it, where we go from here. Um, now as a charity, Horses uh, and the influence of horses and the hum horse-human relationship are absolutely central to us. So we welcome this debate, and I hope we have some thought-provoking debate and in some, some challenging arguments on both sides. Um, and of course, all convened and carried on uh, in an atmosphere of cancel culture free, um, which seems to be the plague for the younger generation. This charity thrives by bringing the horse world together to think about the future and to continually challenge the status quo. And I hope this conference continues that theme. Thank you very much.
The relationship between horses and humans has existed for thousands of years. As a species, horses evolved, as we all did, in nature. And then we domesticated them and bred them according to our needs. We have benefited immeasurably from their resilience, strength and intelligence. They have helped us build the civilizations, cities and cultures we have today. But the world is a very different place to what it was when our relationship with them first began. Through their evolution, equids have demonstrated a remarkable ability to adapt to changing ecosystems. And today, herds of wild horses still show incredible resilience, thriving in a wide range of environments. From the arid climates of North America, to the humidity of Indonesia, to the snowy Siberian plains. They are living examples of evolution in action, owing their existence to a unique blend of biological adaptations, behavioral strategies, and their incredible ability to make the most of the environments they inhabit. But the world has changed rapidly in recent history, and humans have become the single most influential species on the planet. We have significantly altered the landscape and damaged the environment through pollution and the destruction of ecosystems. So how do horses today fit into this picture? Can a horse be both nature's friend and a foe? Some suggest that without the domestication of horses, the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have happened at the pace it did, with horses having more varied jobs during the Industrial Era than at any other time. And it was this step change in civilization that led to human activities, such as the burning of fossil fuels, that have increased greenhouse gas concentrations in our atmosphere. There is no doubt that climate change and the increase in global temperatures is putting pressure on so many living species. But what effect is it having on equids that have been so resilient to changes in the past? How are these increasing temperatures and extreme conditions affecting working horses that play a vital role in supporting communities that are experiencing some of the most challenging effects of climate change? And what role can we play to help these animals and their owners cope with these changes? Semi-feral populations of horses can be instrumental in conserving biodiversity and managed habitats. But concerns are growing about rising competition for resources, such as the undeniable impact on biodiversity by unmanaged herds in the United States, Australia, and even within Britain's national parks. And for countries where horses are used for sport and leisure, what impact does the way we conduct these activities have on the environment? Top-level competition horses are flown around the world to compete. People regularly transport horses across the country and across borders for sport, breeding, sale or slaughter. Many domesticated horses are kept on monocultures of paddock grass. They produce methane, a known greenhouse gas, but they also produce manure, which is highly rated as a natural fertilizer. And they require veterinary care, where some of the drugs involved can have a detrimental impact on the environment. So, what is our role in striving to ensure our involvement with horses is not only sustainable, but benefits the planet. What opportunities are there for horses to support biodiversity rather than threaten it? Can they, and should they, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels? What initiatives can we implement to reduce the environmental impact of having horses? And is there a link between good welfare and a healthy environment? The concept of One Health recognizes that the health of humans, animals and plants and the wider environment are closely linked and interdependent. 
But do we also share one welfare? Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Horse Welfare Conference 2023. Thank you, World Horse Welfare, for a fascinating film, and thank you, Michael, for your words. Now, we're just going to quickly go to our first poll that we took earlier. So do you think that horses are more of a friend or a foe of the environment? And it looks like the audience has come out in favour of the horse in the majority as a friend. So that's a very interesting starting point for us today. Um, now, I'd like to very much welcome now Roly Owers to the stage, World Horse Welfare's Chief Executive, who will introduce today's question, horses in the environment, are they friend or foe? Roly. Neil, thank you. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing that fear, strikes the fear of dread into the Chief Executive's heart when their chairman says they're going to go off piste. So I stand before you a very relieved man, and Michael, thank you very much for your very kind words indeed. But I'm delighted that everyone has joined us here today to consider whether horses are a friend or foe to the environment, a topic which may not immediately seem to relate to equine welfare. Following the inspiration of our founder, Ada Cole, World Horse Welfare strives to be a force for change through building bridges and bringing others along with us towards a world where every horse is treated with respect, compassion and understanding. We were founded nearly a century ago as a campaigning organisation that pe believed that people had a duty to protect the welfare of the horses that they benefited so much from. And that duty extends from birth to death. This is still very much part of our DNA, which is why we believe that to help horses, we need to help people help horses. And our strategy works across several fronts to try to achieve this. We make impact by providing care, working directly with horses. In Britain, this involves rescuing over 300 horses in need every year, rehabilitating them and finding them loving new homes. And across Africa, Latin America, Asia and Europe, we work through our partners to improve the lives of working horses, donkeys and mules, reaching 85,000 equids last year alone. We make impact at scale globally with a single-minded focus on moving the dial on horse welfare standards. Through our education and influencing activities, we seek to impact millions of horses, whether family pets, horses involved in sport and leisure, those used for work or for the production of meat. A horse is a horse is a horse, and we can all and must strive to continuously improve their welfare to fulfil our responsibilities in the horse-human relationship. Through our research with universities, leading academics, or our own investigations, we look to shed light on the welfare challenges, including those that others might find difficult or even too sensitive to explore, such as the impact of long journeys on horse welfare and how to make equine slaughter as humane as possible. And our support for a responsible future for horse sport is evident in our research with the Royal Veterinary College to produce an ethical framework for the involvement of horses in sport, as is our work exploring how other animal industries have transformed themselves to strengthen their social licence. Only through education and influence can we empower people to give truly every horse the life they deserve, no matter what role they play. So what about the environment and the horse's involvement in this? We know that every horse is an individual, but as the late philosopher Roger Scruton said at our conference a few years ago, a horse is just an incomplete part of a herd. As people, we too are individuals, but we are also in complete parts of our own herd of another highly social species. And like it or not, we all rely on the environment and each other. 
None of us operates in a vacuum. We are constantly responding to, shaping, or mitigating our environment. This is not new. It was always this way. Horses and humans have evolved in nature. And humans eventually domesticated horses to transport them across the environment and then to use them to manage the environment. Through grazing, draft power, and hauling the materials to build our civilization. So horses have always been our partner in land management as well as history. But that partnership has not always had a smooth ride. The great manure crisis of 1894 was debated at the world's first international urban planning conference in New York. It seemed urban civilization was doomed. According to newspapers, in 50 years, every street in London would be buried under nine feet of manure from its growing population of working horses. We know today that this never transpired. Motorised transport possibly seemed a saviour, but we know now that has posed its own challenges for the environment, as has our shift predominantly to keeping horses for sport, leisure and competition in so many parts of the world. In many industrialised countries, land is now managed for horses taking part in these activities, but at what cost to the environment? We ride them on roads and compete them in arenas with all bond cons and extensive parking for our cars and horse boxes. We drive them many miles in diesel vehicles or fly them across the world, adding to our environmental footprint. We put them on paddocks, often covered with a monoculture of lawn-like grass, sometimes use artificial fertilisers and pesticides or remove trees and hedges and keep what is left of our greenery so tidy there is no place for nature to blossom. We build impressive heated or air-conditioned stables and construct sprawling yards that use seemingly unlimited quantities of water to keep the grass green and the horses and building clean. Medicines and wormers we use for our horses too often unnecessarily pass on to the land, contaminating our earth and the living things around us. In constructing the modern horse world around sport and leisure, have we lost sight of what it means to be land managers in our pursuit to be more efficient more horse managers? World Health Welfare is certainly not an exception here. We have had to really challenge our own thinking about how we use the most basic resources in our effort to uh, reduce our environmental footprint. We are on a very steep learning curve, but I've already found that it is so, there is so much opportunity to improve both welfare and our environment, and there is still so much more to learn. And it's not just in competition and leisure that our impact on the environment has gone out of kilter. Horses eaten for food used to be a way of making use of an animal that no longer had a useful working life, a sustainable source of protein. But today, they are transported live for hundreds, if not thousands of miles, by road, air or sea, to be served as a delicacy. This has devastating uh, impact for their welfare and does needless damage to the planet. There can be no rational justification for the continuation of this trade, which should be on the hook and not on the hoof. And then there is the impact that global warming is having on our horses. Rising temperatures raise real questions about where we hold our competitions, how we transport our horses and for how long. The effects of flooding or drought on grazing or competition is already an issue and will become an even bigger one. And the threat posed by exotic diseases moving into countries where horses do not have the immunity to survive them grows every day. Likewise, so many of the areas where working equids sustain human life are at the sharp end of the effects of a changing climate. As the original green power source, equids have long been used as a sustainable mode of transport, draft power and traction. And four-fifths of the world's 125 million horses, donkeys and mules are still performing these roles for over 600 million people in communities across the globe. But extreme weather, droughts, lack of forage and floods are putting huge pressure on these communities and their animals, as we'll shortly hear from Dr. Sen. 
Yet, this adversity also shows how these equids are often essential to adapting to changing conditions and are of increasing value to these communities. They provide the adaptability, the mobility to find new pasture or clean water or bring food to livestock. The vital role, this vital role, urgently needs to be better recognised in government and development policies and funding. And of course, without a doubt, equines and what we do with them can be huge assets to environmental sustainability, as we'll hear from Roof Dancer in a moment. Their low impact when traversing sensitive land can make them essential to agriculture, including in the vineyards of Europe and in forestry. The impact of semi-feral equine populations grazing can, if appropriately managed, be hugely beneficial for the environment, as we'll hear from Carol Laidlaw later today. Their manure, when managed responsibly, is an excellent cost-free organic fertiliser that supports invertebrates that are so vital to the ecosystem, and was even used as a fuel for an FEI jumping World Cup qualifier in 2019. The benefits of horses go further. Horses link people to the earth and the sky, is another point that Roger Scruton made. They spend their time looking down at the earth, getting sustenance from it, and when we ride or have contact with them, they bring us into the sky and into nature and force us into more of a natural rhythm. There can be few better examples of this than the extraordinary links developed through so many equine-assisted activities. Or the tourist industry, where horse riding is a feature in trekking holidays, which can bring people into nature, which often leads to less of an environmental footprint. And even with horse riding, equestrian businesses are often vital links between rural and urban communities. And increasingly, we are seeing horses being brought back into urban communities to provide that connection. So when we start to think about the future and what we can do about these challenges, it is vital to remember that sustainability is about adaptation as well as mitigation. For sure, governments have a role to play in creating a more sustainable world, as Senator Hackett will discuss. But much, much more is up to us. Regulators, sports organisations, veterinary bodies, pharmaceutical companies, equestrian businesses, colleges, yards, and each and every horse owner can and must be agents for change. But many of us will understandably ask, what can we do? And some will want to point the fingers at others or look at the big organisations and wait for new regulations. But that is not how the world often changes. The world does change when we choose to change our attitudes and behaviour. And there is plenty we as individuals can do now, as we will hear throughout today, including from Jenny Rogers, who has forged her own path uh, with a yard dedicated to sustainability. What this all adds up to is that we all share one future. Many of you may be aware of One Health, the concept accepted by institutions and governments across the world about the health of humans, animals and the environment being inextricably linked. One welfare is a related, equally important concept where the welfare of humans, animals and the environment are equally intertwined. The more we explore this concept and experience it, the more we will understand that we need to address, address all three to be truly sustainable. And one welfare is also important for maintaining public acceptance, our social license, for all activities with horses. We will be judged by society on how we treat our horses, on how environmentally sustainable our activities are, and how successful equestrianism is in becoming more inclusive, engaging the full range of people who can benefit from and be inspired by horses. But we know none of these are new ideas. The business world has been talking about corporate social responsibility for decades. And now the emphasis is on the environmental, social and governance framework as the three major challenges not only facing corporations, but very much wider society too. All of us here today, in person or online, can influence the future. We are all in the same herd. We will hear a lot today about the realities, 
the challenges and the ways to overcome them. I hope having listened to the presentations and engaged in the discussions, you will have a be better place to answer these questions in a balanced way. What impact is my relationship with horses making on the horses, the environment, and other people? What changes can I make on my own, and what changes will I make with other people? If we can all start thinking about our wider herds and the opportunities we have to make even the smallest change, then together we will have taken one really important step forward. Together, through care, research, education and influence, we can help to ensure that horses and humans both play their part in affecting real positive change for the environment and the lives that we and future generations live within it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rolly, for a very thought-provoking presentation. Can I put on my rec uh, record my thanks to World Horse Welfare for their strong advocacy in raising the plight of the countless number of horses that have been illegally exported to, to Europe for, for slaughter, and they've been really strong champions advocating that cause. And I was delighted to witness His uh, Majesty the King's speech this week when the government has announced measures to ban the live export of animals for fattening and slaughter. So World Horse Welfare, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Rolly. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who has been playing a critical role in the future of horse sport. Ruth Dancer is the director of White Griffin, a consultancy that has been working with horse sport to help them navigate a pathway to become more environmentally sustainable. Ruth has worked with the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, Goodwood, the Lingfield Estate, and more recently, the British Horse Racing Authority, British Equestrian and Horse Sport Ireland. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you very much. Earlier this year, I went for a working lunch with a client. I think she happens to be in the audience today, actually. Um, and on our way into the venue, there was a man in the doorway. And uh, he was stood in front of a, a beclothed table with the usual banner with pictures of hedgehogs and uh, squirrels and oak trees, and you get the picture. And he interjected very cheerily into our conversation and said, are you lovers of nature? To which my client said, of course we are, we're equestrians. And without missing a beat, the man turned around and said, so no then. And my client was understandably upset, a bit dejected, frustrated. It never occurred to her that being an equestrian precluded her from being a lover of nature. But to the man in the doorway, at least, horses, or perhaps those that ride them, are a foe to the environment. And it's frustrating to think that the sport that has the most connection with nature is perceived that way, perhaps by those outside of our sport. Because the horse is, of course, a mammal. As we've heard from, from Rowley, in the wild, in nature, it grazes for up to 20 kilometers a day, um, over 100 different species of plant and shrub, producing small indentations that are perfect habitats for small creatures that are so important to our ecosystem. And of course, producing rich, nutritious fertilizer for our ground through its manure. The horse is good for the environment. And perhaps where we're going wrong is to forget its job in nature and perhaps instead giving it the name of the athlete. I was at a, a talk recently um, where a man enthusiastically talked about um, the creation of the man-made horse, and he was referring to a racehorse. Now, don't get me wrong, breeding, producing, training racehorses is, is an inordinately impressive activity. But perhaps we need to remember, as impressive as that is, they are still a mammal. I was very fortunate that earlier this year I was allowed to go into one of the um, most fabulous uh, breeders in the world. And whilst I was there looking around the sort of Kensington and Chelsea-esque uh, yard in which they're housed, I noticed that uh, my favourite horse wasn't in his stable. And I said to the gentleman showing us around, where is this horse? 
And uh, he said, come with me. And we took a little scamper, a little further around, to a, a large field, and in it stood a magnificent horse covered head to toe in mud. And he said, he is here, madam. Right, OK. And he said, yes, he doesn't like to be in his stables, ever. So when he's required, he goes to do what's required of him, and then he returns back to his field. And I have to say that that horse continues to be my favorite horse, because in addition to his fabulous sporting career, he is now spending the rest of his life reminding us that he is, in fact, a horse. And so when we consider the question of the environment, friend or foe, perhaps we should recognize that there is a difference between the horse and then the sport. And perhaps this is where we are a little more challenged. Um, as was mentioned, in 2022, I was fortunate enough to complete a report for the British Horse Racing Authority, sponsored by the Racing Foundation, and then this year for the British Equestrian Federation and Horse Sport Ireland, into the impacts of environmental sustainability on equestrianism and horse riding, racing. And this included the risks, challenges, and opportunities, as well as baselining where we're at. Now, there are many ways of looking at environmental sustainability. I like to boil it down to just four for the sake of this not becoming a sort of a Royal Institution Christmas lecture today, although it is much more complex than this. We clearly have impacts with climate change produced by the excessive um, production of greenhouse gases. We have issues, huge issues worldwide with water shortages. We have issues with resource use and the production therefore um, and disposal of waste. And finally, tremendous biodiversity loss. These four issues are the predominant ones and they are interconnected. And of course, as with all sports, all industries and all businesses, horse racing and equine sports impact on all of these areas. We talk a lot about our, our travel and transport. We don't talk quite so much about our generator use. And in fact, it's worth knowing that the use of generators in the UK for events, not just for horse events, for all events, is so substantial, it's actually equivalent to the entire country of Malta. It's a very small, lesser known thing, but we really rely on them for our horse sports. Our water consumption, of course, as Rolly has outlined, in terms of how we prepare our surfaces, is very water intensive. More than half our race courses in this country still use mains water for the tracks. Our resources, of course, we use feed and bedding and amongst a huge array of others, and that production of feed and bedding requires land. These are all very obvious points. This is just common sense, but of course we have to think about this. Because when we look at something like football, we don't need huge fields to produce food to create a football. But for a horse, we need to fields um, that require water, it requires the land use, and it requires the diesel for the tractors. And of course, our use of plastics through various items, but particularly supplements. And finally, our land use. And yes, this is a tremendously contentious point, but as Rowley identified, the way that we use our land, particularly in horse sports and, and uh, horse racing, can be damaging to the land, particularly where we use our fields in overstocked ways. We find we have horse-sick paddocks. And of course, the, uh, the way in which nitrates and worming uh, drugs leach into our environment is hugely damaging. But interesting enough to me, we only really ever talk about one thing, transport. And this is a problem because it's a limiting focus of attention. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the fact that we transport horses by air and on roads isn't a problem. It is a problem. It's a big problem. It does create a large carbon footprint. And it's also a big problem because we are not precluded from the environment the, uh, uh, legislative changes coming in 2030 or 2035 um, that mean that we will not be selling petrol and diesel transport anymore. We are not exempt from that, and yet the only options available to us, as you can see on the screen, are the Equitrek electric transporter and this one Whitaker hybrid transporter, which has been sold to a show jumping family, despite the fact that it is more cost effective, better for the environment, and the manufacturer of the chassis is desperate to produce more, they're not producing any more, they're just producing one. So we need to make sure that we are lobbying industry and government to remedy that problem for us. It's coming very, very quickly. But more importantly to me is the point that we are more than just a horse box. 
by focusing our attention on this and saying, we can't possibly talk about the environment because everyone will mention the fact that we transport our horses, means we miss out on a huge area of opportunity. In fact, let me rephrase that. We are more than a horse box. We are the sport of the land. We are at home on the land. We rely on the land. It's where we train, where we breed, where we relax and rest. We are a mostly rural sport, but just being of the land doesn't mean we are good for the land. We need to look a little deeper than that. I'm lucky enough to live in Gloucestershire, and I travel around the countryside every day, and I see nothing but opportunity. There are fences that could be complemented by hedgerows. There are large empty paddocks that could be complemented uh, by shady trees. We are the one sport that can make a big difference. We're landowners. We're land users. We hold the key. My background is in sport, as you heard from the introduction, and I hear all the time, I must admit it slightly bothers me, about the power of sport to make change. And we have seen it time and again, even in war and peace. But we haven't cracked this nut yet. Despite the hard work going on, particularly in football, in uh, sailing, and to some extent in tennis and other sports, we still haven't cracked that nut. And we, as a sport, are actually the ones that can make a substantial difference. We can impact on the health of our land. And it doesn't just help the environment. As Rowley alluded to in his opening speech, there is an interconnectedness of all the issues that affect our sports. But the environment is at the center of all of it. Someone recently said in another speech, we must first look to ensure that we are financially stable. No. We must first look to ensure we have an environment on which to run our sports. It is the building blocks for everything else. And incidentally, our concern for finances is absolutely right. You can't run a, a, anything without money. But by having a sport with purpose, we can actually look to new sponsors, new commercial partners, who are keen to partner with people that have purpose. It opens up more opportunity. And horse welfare and environmental sustainability absolutely go hand in hand. Our horse wants and thrives in a healthy environment. It wants the shade of trees. It wants healthy grassland. That stud that I mentioned earlier are absolute pillars of exemplary activity. And the one thing they care about more than anything is the quality of that grass, the length of that sward, because they know that that produces the best possible horses. But from our perspective, it also produces carbon sequestration potential and is beneficial for the nature and the environment in general. We also know we have an issue with equality, diversity, and inclusion. We know in horse racing, we've got a 20-year staffing crisis, and there is a, a general issue around the way we are perceived. By looking at environmental sustainability, we are opening ourselves up to the next generation. And my gosh, they know about this stuff. They care about it because they know it will impact them. They hold us accountable to the decisions we are making now. And all of this is wrapped up, as Rody said, in the one big issue of social license. Social license isn't just about horse welfare. It's about a license to operate, and increasingly that includes the environment. We cannot be seen, anybody in any industry, to be damaging the environment. We have seen in 2023 a huge uplift in activism at sporting events, disrupting snooker, of all things, and amongst many others. So that social license piece is about so much more than horse welfare. And ultimately, by putting environmental sustainability at the center of what we do, we help to create the horse-human planet partnership for a whole new generation. And this is a really important point because we need to get back onto the right path. AI, technology, all these things that are part of the modern world are moving us further and further away from our appreciation of nature. Perhaps through history, we can see that the horse and people and horses are the golden thread that, that has been spun for years that tell us that humans are part of the ecosystem. We need shade from trees. We need healthy food. We need to be taking less drugs. We are no different from horses in that respect. And by encouraging the relationship between horse and human, we are also encouraging that relationship 
with nature. We are part of the same ecosystem. We must take care of it. So how do we do that? How do we do that? I always dreamt of a moment where I could bring Blue Peter into a speech. Well, there are two ways, and the first one is easy. And again, Riley has stolen my thunder here, but ultimately, we need to be thinking about the simple ways in which we make change. This topic has been overcomplicated and it frustrates me. Too many complex terms, too much discussion about is something good or bad. It's simple. Do less of what is bad, do more of what is good. We know what it is. It's a little bit like weight loss. We know if you want to lose weight, we need to eat healthily, exercise more, drink a little bit less, and have lots of water. It's been thus for a long time, but we prefer to think, oh gosh, is there a slimming pill out there? Or maybe if the surgeon can just hack a bit. We know what to do. We do know what to do. But the thing that holds us back is we focus on the things that are not in our control. Do the things that are in your control in your personal and professional life, and leave everything else to someone else. Those other activities are in their control. Don't let that stop you from making the change. So what does that look like? Well, it can look like a lot of different things. And this is really about um, what makes sense for you, where your pain threshold is. For some people, money is a real challenge, so it's not appropriate to talk about installing renewable technology. But maybe it is um, appropriate to talk about switching lights and appliances off. Maybe for you, it would be easy to have a little bit less dairy, a little bit less fish, a little bit less meat. For some people, that's an abhorrent idea, but maybe for those people, um, planting more plants for pollinators would be preferable. This is a good time of year to think about change. We're coming towards New Year's resolutions. So perhaps on the train, on the way home, take a look at that list and think, is there anything on there that I can do? And just simply do it. Um, I know that World Horse Welfare are a little uncomfortable about this, but I'm fortunate that I spend my time talking with people who are making those changes. But what they're very bad at is talking broadly and communicating and celebrating that they're doing that. And World Horse Welfare are doing an awful lot, and whilst I appreciate that they are at the start of their journey in some respects, in others they're very well advanced, and, and they are one of many companies um, that, that can feel confident to talk about it. On the screen, you can see just a few examples of hedge planting, um, not mowing the verges, giving more um, space to wildflowers, rainwater harvesting, Rowley's electric car, um, even creating poo bricks for, um, for generating energy. And the bottom right one is maybe my favorite. They clean the windows. They clean the windows in their stable block. And funnily enough, they don't need to turn the lights on. Okay, so as I say, environmental sustainability doesn't need to be so complicated. These are simple things that will reduce your energy bill and that will help the environment in turn and help the horses. People are making changes. We just need to communicate it more, and really that's the second and more difficult aspect. The harder thing to do, the biggest barrier, it's not about money. It's not really even about time. It's about the ability to change our mindset. I work in this space because I see unprecedented opportunity. The world of horse sports and horse racing is about an appreciation for the natural world. We need it. Telling people about the science, telling people that the world is going to come to an end for humans, at least, is not working. It's not working. What people need to know is that they can be part of something bigger than themselves that if they make a small change, they can benefit something much more important. And being intrinsically linked to the natural world does that. It's maybe the only sport that does that. Maybe we are the only ones that can change mindsets. By showing best practice in things like land management, it's our natural space. And it's what our horses want us to do. There is no horse welfare without caring for our environment. We don't need billions of climate activists. What we need is millions of people that care just enough to make small changes every day in the short, medium, and long term. And it's difficult, but we can. Because as my client believes, we do love nature. We need to prove the man in the doorway wrong. We need people, just enough people, who care just enough about the environment to make that huge impact. 
And so I want to take inspiration from Blue Peter, because how do we do that? Well, they knew, and they were very successful at it. The Blue Peter thermometer is quite simply the way we get people to engage in this. We wouldn't get very far if we said, can we have some money, please, but we're not going to tell you what for, and when you give it to us, we're not going to tell you how much of an improvement that's made. We have to say where we're at, what we want to do, and then notice the change as it happens. So this means, what is my water consumption before and what is it after? What was my energy consumption before? What is it after? What butterflies did I see before? What do I see now? Notice the improvement, celebrate it, and communicate it. It works. Blue Peter knows that. We need this to change our mindsets, to keep us motivated. It's a simple vision. We don't need to overcomplicate this. We all know what we're doing. We do, really. And I believe our sport can be a beacon for biodiversity and that we can create a healthy environment, not despite horses being in it, but because of. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, and I'm hopeful with all the connections in this room that you will be sent a Blue Peter badge, hopefully. <laughs> Roly, I'm sure you can sort that one out. Um, but thank you, Ruth, for your, your passion for the sustainability of, of, of horse sport and leisure in, and for the ability for all of us to, to, to play our part is truly inspirational. I was very struck by your comments about the social license for us to continue using horses and using horses for sport it has to include the environment as well as horse health welfare. I'm sure there'll be many more questions for you later. So now we move from the wet and green landscapes of England to the hotter and drier climate of Senegal. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is a doctor of veterinary medicine and director of equine development at the Ministry of Livestock and Animal Production in Senegal. Dr. Sen is highly experienced in all matters regarding equines, including horse racing, and stud farms, as well as the working horses, donkeys, and mules that World Horse Welfare works with. Over to you, Dr. Sen. Ce Sénégal, un mauvais pays ouest africain, avait une population estimée à 11 millions en 2007. Et en 2012, les projections ramenaient cette population à 17 millions d'habitants. L'élevage joue un rôle important puisqu'il représente 35,5% de la valeur ajoutée du secteur primaire et 4% du PIB. L'élevage est prédominant dans la zone sylvopastorale où il est extensif, tandis que le sud est caractérisé par sa vocation agropastorale. En termes de comparaison avec d'autres pays, le Sénégal posséderait le cinquième effectif de chevaux en Afrique, avec des estimations de 551 000 têtes et le septième effectif d'âne, soit 480 000 têtes. Alors pour une meilleure fiabilisation de ces statistiques d'élevage, le Sénégal met en œuvre en ce moment, dans ce deuxième semestre de l'année 2023, un ressassement national de l'élevage, dont les résultats sont en phase de validation. Cependant, en comparaison avec d'autres pays africains, le nombre d'équidés au Sénégal montre l'importance des potentialités de ce sous-secteur. Ce cheptel est réparti de manière homogène sur l'ensemble du territoire. Au niveau du bassin arachidé, qui concentre plus de deux tiers des effectifs et plus de la moitié des armes. Le bassin arachidé suit la zone sylvopastorale avec 9,3% des chevaux et 18% des ânes. La zone méridionale, composée des régions sud, compte 8,6% des chevaux et 16% des ânes. Au niveau du Sénégal, une zone se particularise par le rôle important des équidés, ânes et chevaux. La zone sylvopastorale appelée également Ferlo, qui couvre une superficie de 67 000 km² environ, soit le tiers du territoire national. C'est une zone centre du Sénégal délimitée par le fleuve Sénégal. Cette zone a une population estimée 
à 2 millions 86 000 habitants environ, avec une densité de 30 kilo habitants au kilomètre carré. Dans les zones sèches comme le Ferlo, les écosystèmes sont caractérisés par une dynamique écologique déséquilibrée. Les précipitations sont très variables dans l'espace et dans le temps, ce qui détermine la disponibilité de l'eau et des pâturages. Dans de tels environnements, le pastoralisme est un système rationnel et économique d'utilisation des terres dans lesquelles un retour sur investissement optimal est recherché. En termes économiques, en termes sociaux, en termes environnementaux et culturels. La mobilité qui caractérise ce pastoralisme permet d'amener les animaux vers des pâturages riches et abondants, optimisant ainsi les, leurs gains pondérales et leur production. Et la transhumance, qui est une de ces facettes de la mobilité pastorale, permettant l'exploitation euh, des complémentarités interzonales, constitue une véritable construction sociale économique sans cesse renouvelée et réadaptée. Cependant, c'est tout ce système qui est aujourd'hui menacé en raison des effets des changements climatiques et des impacts négatifs dans l'activité humaine sur l'environnement. Ces impacts négatifs apportés par l'homme s'appellent les faux de brousse, l'augmentation des terres réservées à l'agriculture, le surpâturage, les politiques de sédentarisation des éleveurs autour des hydrages électroniques, hydrauliques plutôt. En conséquence, le pastoralisme dans la région du Ferlo est fragilisé par l'incertitude croissante qui entoure ses disponibilités de ressources naturelles. Dans cette zone en constante diminution, cette situation accroît la vulnérabilité des populations pastorales. Dans les sociétés pastorales, le bétail est la première forme d'épargne. Les revenus proviennent de la vente des animaux, du lait, de ses dérivés et des produits de l'agroforesterie. Outre l'achat de nourriture, les petits ruminants sont utilisés pour acquérir et renouveler des équipements, payer de l'eau, acheter des aliments pour les animaux. Et ces petits ruminants assurent le fonctionnement quotidien des camps et garantissent la survie et l'accumulation de bétail. En effet, plus l'éleveur a de petits ruminants, moins il a le besoin de vendre de gros bétails pour subvenir à ses besoins. Les camps Poma étant disséminés dans tout le pays, les équidés en, en tête assurent l'ensemble du transport traditionnel. Bien avant, avant l'apparition des forages, les zones pastorales étaient caractérisées par une répartition éparse des mares autour des mares temporaires, autour des ouro ou campements villages, appelés villages. Et ces campements réservaient un espace de vie reconnu appelé Urum. L'ensemble de ces Urum, d'une zone présentant une certaine homogénéité, était appelé Noku. Et cette règle fondamentale d'occupation de l'espace, basée sur le point d'eau, était le système de gestion des systèmes pastoraux. Alors, depuis l'introduction des points d'eau permanents, je veux dire les forages, au niveau du ferlo, depuis les années 50, assurant l'approvisionnement en saison sèche de l'eau, les pasteurs peul ont conservé les formes traditionnelles d'habitat sous forme de campements dispersés dans un rayon de 15 km autour de ces ouvrages. Ainsi, au grand mouvement de transhumance qui était de règle dans le centre et le sud du pays, qu'on appelait « grande transhumance » ou qu'on appelle toujours « grande transhumance », s'ajoutent des mouvements circulaires autour de ces forages appelés petites transhumances. Pendant la saison sèche, les éleveurs à la recherche de pâturage se déplacent sur de courtes distances avec toute la, leur famille dans des campements de fortune appelés sédanons, construits avec des matériaux locaux, bois et paille. Alors pendant la saison de pluie maintenant, les éleveurs retournent dans leurs campements d'hiver appelés roumanons qui sont les points d'attache et servant de marqueurs identitaires. Aujourd'hui, les chevaux et les ânes en particulier ne peuvent plus rester les travailleurs invisibles dans les paysages ruraux, dans les centres urbains. Dans le monde rural, la prééminence des usages domestiques ou non commerciaux en termes de transactions financières ou d'économie sur les coûts de transport fait l'objet désormais d'une documentation 
dans les domaines de transport de l'eau et pour les besoins humains et animaux. La force motrice des chevaux et des ânes est une composante essentielle dans les activités génératrices de revenus, notamment au niveau de l'attraction agricole, au niveau des prestations de services, mais également au niveau même de la pêche artisanale, notamment avec le transport des filets de pêche, au niveau du transport des produits de pêche des bateaux vers le quai, ainsi de suite. Dans les zones sylvopastorales et dans, la zone, dans le système d'élevage transhumain en général, la force de trait des équidés, en particulier des ânes, est un facteur déterminant dans l'organisation et la productivité de l'élevage pastoral. Ainsi, dans l'accès au marché et aux services sociaux de base, la possibilité d'apporter de l'eau aux animaux, notamment aux petits ruminants, grâce à des charrettes équipées de chambres, chambres à air, dont les capacités sont de 200 litres, de divorce tonneaux et fûts, voire de citernes mobiles, a révolutionné l'élevage des petits ruminants en réduisant l'une des principales contraintes, à savoir le manque d'eau. Les mouvements de transhumants sont facilités par un accès moins contraignant à une eau de meilleure qualité que celle des mares d'hivernage, combinée à une plus grande autonomie par rapport aux points d'abreuvement et à une plus grande variété de pâturages disponibles. La croissance du nombre de petits ruminants observés au cours des dernières années dans les zones sylvopastorales est en grande partie due à la force de traction des ânes. Les ânes apportent donc une contribution essentielle à l'amélioration la de la productivité, des revenus, des conditions de vie des pasteurs. La transhumance est impossible sans les chevaux et les ânes, les pasteurs voyageant en famille. Pour des raisons de sécurité, les enfants ne peuvent pas être laissés en, à la maison. Ils seront transportés sur des charrettes asinées et équines jusqu'aux zones de pâturage. Les chevaux et les ânes transportent tout ce qui doit être déplacé. Le troupeau, les bagages, les éleveurs et les femmes, ils vont chercher l'eau au point d'eau. Les chevaux sont utilisés pour rechercher les troupeaux égarés. Ces animaux accompagnent la transhumance tout au long de son déroulement et effectuent toutes les tâches liés au déplacement et au chargement. Ils participent à la constitution de réserves fourragères assurant la mobilité des communautés, puisent l'eau quotidiennement, font du commerce, tirent les récoltes, ainsi de suite. Alors le cheval et l'âne sont les principaux moyens de transport en zone pastorale. Ces animaux invisibles sont affectés par les changements climatiques. Alors à cause de ces changements, il est urgent d'adapter les pratiques agricoles et pastorales à ces nouvelles conditions environnementales afin d'assurer un développement durable dans cette zone durement éprouvée. Les sites peuvent être surpâturés en raison des changements climatiques. Alors la, les ressources diminuent, les ressources végétales notamment. La terre exerce une forte pression. L'offre diminuant, les trajets s'allongent d'une année à l'autre, et les enfants, dans ces conditions, n'ont pas d'accès à l'éducation. Les ânes et les équidés, en général, peuvent parcourir jusqu'à 10 km pour aller chercher de l'eau, pour les familles et le bétail. Alors, il est devenu difficile d'obtenir de l'eau à cause de ces changements climatiques. La source s'est rarifiée. Les animaux sont affectés par la sécheresse et les familles doivent choisir entre leurs besoins et les besoins des animaux. Alors il est difficile dans ces situations de fixer des priorités au sein de ces familles pastorales. C'est pour cette raison que certaines recommandations émergent pour protéger les animaux contre ces changements climatiques en ces termes. Notamment améliorer les conditions de vie et de travail de ces animaux, sensibiliser et former les propriétaires et les utilisateurs, Développer des pratiques agricoles durables, notamment avec la production de cultures fourragères. Développer également des activités de résilience. Au total donc, le ferlo avec une pluviométrie moyenne inférieure à 400 mm par an, subit les effets de sécheresse récurrente en plus de son confinement par le front agricole. Cependant, il dispose de plusieurs atouts, notamment l'expérience acquise par les éleveurs dans la gestion des crises depuis la nuit des temps, la disponibilité de l'eau qui leur permet d'exploiter les pâturages autrefois inaccessibles, 
la disponibilité des chevaux en général et des ânes, en particulier comme source de traction animale ainsi comme patrimoine animalier riche et varié. Sur exploités et négligés par les propriétaires, les équidés de traits et les ânes en particulier sont les parents pauvres des politiques d'élevage. Cependant, il ressort de différentes utilisations des équidés dans le ferlo qu'ils sont un facteur de performance de l'élevage pastoral, une source d'emploi stable et durable et un atout essentiel dans les stratégies de sécurisation des populations. Il est donc un grand temps d'intégrer les équidés dans les politiques d'élevage. Et au niveau du gouvernement sénégalais, c'est ainsi qu'au cours des 20 dernières années, la filière a connu un développement important avec la réhabilitation de certaines structures comme le Hara de Dara à partir de 1999, le lancement du programme de développement de la filière Ekikin Prodaf en 2004 qui doit prendre fin en 2023 et la création du Hara national, la création de la direction du développement des équidés mais également la création du ministère dédié dont les compétences sont étendues au niveau de l'ensemble des équidés en 2012, je veux dire la direction du développement des équidés. Enfin, le lancement en 2023 d'un nouveau programme de développement appelé le Programme national de développement des équidés, PRONODEF. En 2019, la direction du développement des équidés, sous l'égide du ministère de l'élevage et des productions animales, avait élaboré une nouvelle stratégie de développement de la filière équine afin d'assurer la cohérence entre les programmes et projets. Et en outre, nous avons identifié un certain nombre d'opportunités de recherche qui pourraient orienter les décideurs, notamment par l'harmonisation et l'intégration des politiques équines au niveau sous-régional. Une meilleure promotion des ânes surtout, à travers des activités spécifiques, telles que l'organisation d'une journée qui leur sera dédié. Une meilleure stratégie de sensibilisation et de formation des acteurs du ferlo aux soins appropriés à apporter aux chevaux. La spécificité des équidés devrait être prise en compte dans certains projets et dans la formulation de ces projets, grands projets identifiés actuellement au niveau du ministère de l'élevage, notamment le PRAPS, le projet de développement durable des exploitations pastorales au Sahel, PEDAPS et également le programme de développement intégré de l'élevage appelé PNGES. Enfin, conscient de l'importance des équidés comme source de profit durable et de bien-être pour les populations qui bénéficient de leurs activités, nous sommes très reconnaissants aux ONG et associations telles que votre host welfare qui depuis leur implantation au niveau du Sénégal en 2010, ont rendu un grand service dans les domaines du plaidoyer, de la collecte de fonds, de la formation et de l'organisation des acteurs. Thank you very much, Dr. Sen. That was a vivid description of the challenges that increasing drought can pose to people and animals. Of course, the vast majority of horses, donkeys, and mules in the world are working animals, and many live in communities that are experiencing the most dramatic effects of changing climate. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, you can post on Twitter, or X if you prefer, with the hashtag carbon hoofprint. Now we are off to Ireland. I would like to introduce our final speaker in this session. We're privileged to have Senator Pippa Hackett, Ireland's Minister of State for Agriculture, with responsibility for land use and biodiversity. The Minister is a member of the Green Party and has a graduate and postgraduate diploma in equine science. As a fellow politician, I've particularly been looking forward to hearing your informed view on policy considerations around horses and the environment. Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Hudson, and it's wonderful to be here uh, this morning. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. 
Um, it looks like a wonderful event. And I really want to thank the um, World Horse Welfare for, for the invitation to participate. Um, and indeed to Ruth, who flagged it with me at the Dublin Horse Show earlier this summer. So uh, really is a pleasure to be here, really to congratulate the organisation on, on the ambitions and the relentless work that it does in ensuring that horses across the world are treated with respect, uh, compassion and understanding. I have a fairly old and faded ILPH um, polo shirt. It must be at least 25 years old at this stage that I wear with pride out in the farm at the weekend. So uh, it's great to be here. Um, you might stick me down for one of those Blue Peter badges as well. <laughs> But I suppose really to give an understanding of the importance of the horse in Ireland, um, I want to really give you a quick crash course on the business side of the sport horse and, and thoroughbred industry in Ireland. Um, as many people will be aware, I mean, Ireland is a huge horse country. Um, from the Irish draft to the Connemara pony, it has a rich heritage there, um, a long history. Um, and we also have a rich equestrian heritage, which has been really long celebrated in Ireland. I, I, we, you know, we do breed and produce exceptionally high quality horses across across the industry. Um, and certainly the equine industry as a whole has a very deep rooted um, history in our culture um, and not just a source of pride either. You know, it pays a significant um, contribution to our economy um, each year. So really, the equine sector in Ireland consists of two, two distinct components, really the thoroughbred side of things and then the sport horse sector. The thoroughbred sector, as it is in the UK, is very um, high profile. Um, the Irish horse racing and thoroughbred industry has an annual economic impact of about 2.5 billion euro per year. And it supports three, sorry, 30,000 direct and indirect jobs across the country. Um, we are the second largest producer of bloodstock in the world after the US um, and we are the third in the world uh, for the number of thoroughbreds uh, fold each year. So we have a lot of horses in that sector. Equally, the sport horse sector in Ireland is a very broad and diverse sector consisting of many different activities, individuals and businesses. And it's worth more than 800 million euro to the economy each year and supports over 14,000 full time jobs. So both sectors are important for all sorts of reasons, but particularly that they offer um, considerable rural employment um, and ver are very much a huge factor um, and a huge part of our social fabric of and that heritage and culture I spoke about. But with that comes responsibility. Um, and I suppose that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, as custodians of this natural heritage and the land, we must acknowledge that the equine sector also has the potential to exert pressures on our natural ecosystems in the same way that other land based economy um, economic industries do. So to my mind, as someone who has a, a deep and long love of horses since I was a child, um, as you said, I, I studied equine science and agricultural science. I ended up doing a PhD in equine biomechanics. Um, so personally, and but certainly as an environmentalist, um, with my role as minister with responsibility for land use and biodiversity, um, I think a lot about that balance we need to strike. Um, and, uh, you know, on one hand, continuing to promote the, the equine industry, um, but also to safeguard our environment for the for the present generation and indeed future generations. Look, in Ireland, we've just seen the, the, the warmest June on record. Um, we had the wettest July on record. Um, and we've experienced a number of significant and damaging, you know, flash flooding in inland and in coastal areas. So we're very much witnessing in real time, and, and this is the, the situation across the world, really, um, witnessing in real time the impacts of climate change and, and ecological degradation. So it's really important that every industry um, takes a long, hard look at its environmental impact. And I think um, Ruth highlighted that very much in her, her own presentation earlier um, and how we, we shift that industry and that sector to more sustainable practices for the greater good. So every single one of us working in the equine industry um, needs to be thinking about our environmental impact. And, and it's not only, you know, it's not only the correct thing to do and the right thing to do. It's really utterly necessary if the, you know, if the horse sector and horse ownership are to retain that social license that Ruth also spoke of. You know, we, we have a social license to operate and we have to look after that. 
in Ireland at the moment, um, we've a, a challenge in terms of land availability. Um, and it's very much a hot topic um, because we've got competing targets for, for agriculture, for forestry, for onshore wind, for peatlands restoration, you name it. There's a lot of things we need to be doing with our land. Um, and, you know, really, particularly in the Irish psyche, land ownership um, remains a very you know incredibly sensitive issue um for lots of historical issues that i won't get into today but um you know i suppose be aware that it is uh, it's it's a sensitive topic but we are now at the stage um that every time a holding of a few hundred acres of of good land good land uh, comes on the market in certain parts of the country there is a sense of uh, resigned inevitability um among farmers and other land-based industries that they will ultimately be outbid by someone in the equine industry. And this sense of land being gobbled up by the equine industry is beginning to seep out into the wider public discourse. So even though very few players can afford to pay the vast sums of money for, for these hundreds of, of acres, um, the impact um, and the wider um, influence and effect of that attaches really to the whole industry um, and, and to all horse owners in one sense. And uh, that is a challenge. So without a doubt, there's very much a spotlight now on the impact of the equine sector on the Irish landscape. And the industry can no longer really, as I said, to afford to take that social license for granted. So in Ireland, well, I mean, what do we do? What are we, what are we doing about this? I mean, in 2023, I mean, we passed legislation in terms of dealing with the climate emissions, you know, so we've now obligated our state um, to have its emissions by 2030 and to, you know, reach that net zero, that magic figure by 2050. Um, in 2023, we, we, and each year we launch a climate action plan by which we attempt to attain those, um, those targets. So our climate action plan, um, you know, has a number of actions across the board. Um, agriculture as a sector itself has been um, required, is required to reduce its emissions by 25 percent by 2030. Um, obviously, the vast majority of agriculture in Ireland is, is livestock based. It's, it's cattle, it's sheep. Um, but still, the Irish equestrian industry has a role to play in, in us reaching those targets. Um, you, you heard from Ruth. Um, she was involved, as she said, in preparing a report for, for our horse sector um, on the environmental sustainability within the Irish equestrian sector, and which was launched at the Dublin Horse Show this summer. Um, and yes, the report concentrated on the sport horse sector, but many of the findings and recommendations are relevant to the thoroughbred sector also. Um, Ruth's report uh, provided a baseline of the environmental and sustainability awareness within the equestrian community, identifying areas of, of existing bets practice and also um, areas of opportunity. And, you know, she in listed a series of recommendations for consideration. I suppose it's also important to say that many of our equine owners in Ireland um, also have other farm enterprises and, and benefit um, directly from agricultural payments and schemes and um, and supplementary payments, many of which are now focused on delivering environmental benefits um, and are focused on supporting nature. So while not directly contributing through maybe their horse ownership, many of these horse owners are being proactive in doing what they can on their that holdings um, to cut agricultural emissions and reverse that biodiverse decline biodiversity decline. Um, but climate action is one aspect of that whole environmental protections. Yes, we know horses have a uh, lower methane output than their four-legged ruminant cousins, um, but the impact of their management on the natural environment can be hugely significant. I mean, we can, we, you know, uh, Ruth mentioned it also, you know, you, these fantastic, you know, beautifully manicured stud farms, you know, with their tightly manicured hedges and lush green fields and you know they look fantastic um but between that and all the way to just routine use for example of anthelmintics without maybe needing to use them all of these management practices can have a detrimental impact on our natural environment and it's i suppose it's up to um those with influence or policy makers to, to highlight that and to put in place measures that support people to be aware initially and then how do we manage 
how do we manage our, our, our stud farms? How do we manage our horses and look after them in a way that doesn't damage the environment? So while we um, expect not only our farmers to play a central role here, we also expect our horse owners too. Back in 2021, um, my department introduced an annual equine census um, for all equines, which really provided an indication of the extent of the, of the industry. Um, and the consensus counts all the numbers of horses and ponies and donkeys and mules, um, even zebras, but I assume they're all in the zoos um, or in, uh, not, not on farms. Um, and, you know, really what it showed in 2022 that there essentially there are 30,000 equine holding premises in Ireland. Um, that's a lot of area. That's a lot of land, a lot of horse owners there. And every one of those 30,000 premises can be working to improve soil quality, improve biodiversity on their land, um, improve the pollinators on their land. Um, and, you know, take a check as to how they manage their farms and how best they can do that um, for, for our natural environment. Um, clearly, within those 30,000 premises, there is an enormous range of land types and enterprises, as I said, from the small hobby enterprises to the world class business operations. But there's a role for everyone to play. I do think, to be honest, we need to work a lot harder in Ireland uh, and with those bigger stud farms in particular, um, some of which don't maybe avail of the farming su subsidies. So therefore, maybe are outside um, some of the environmental conditionality that's associated with payments. So we need to work with them to address their impacts. Um, we certainly need to encourage the bigger commercial operations with significant land holdings, maybe to move away from that um, I suppose, uh, default setting of having that immaculate setup, um, really to think about giving nature a bit more space to breathe, um, while still obviously operating as a top class breeding or training centre. Um, I always compare um, some of the equine uh, holdings with it's not quite the same as like a, an intensive dairy farm, which has to utilise every, you know, blade of grass to its maximum you know to turn that over horses aren't so reliant on on the, the volume of, of fodder or grass or whatever so there is a little bit of flexibility there that we maybe you know can work work on and work towards improving the environmental outcomes um, we are also in Ireland currently reviewing our legislation, which deals with land, things like land restructuring. Um, it could be the rules around the circumstances in which hedges can be taken out, um, the rules around land drainage um, and, and the rules around removing so-called scrub, um, scrubby areas. Um, and we are updating that legislation. I think we will certainly tie up on the, the thresholds that exist currently. Um, and, you know, that will, in, a, in essence, put a little bit more pressure on, on anyone thinking of doing that into the future. And, you know, that applies across the across the board to any land based um, enterprise. And then really for those thousands of farmers, farmers who also keep horses, um, we've put in place a 1.5 billion euro scheme running over the next five years. It's um, it's called Agri Climate Rural Environmental Scheme or much nicer Acres for short. And this really is aimed at it's a voluntary scheme, but farmers who sign up will be delivering for biodiversity, for climate, for air quality, for water quality. And um, they will be, you know, support supported to farm in a way that delivers for nature. And it's good to think that there are horse owners also involved in that. Some of the actions are in, in acres are results based. So farmers get paid um, a higher um, amount based on their delivery, their environmental outcomes they, they achieve. Um, so the more they do, the more they get paid. Um, and the scheme also, which is interesting, includes an option on the conservation of rare breeds. Um, really to in, in order to conserve the genetic diversity of native breeds that are at risk of extinction. And this, this could be farm animals, but it also can be um, equines as well. Um, and within this measure, there are three breeds of equines that are classified in this, um, the Connemara pony, the Kerry bog pony, and the Irish draft, um, three of which, which represent, as I said at the start, our rich and sort of varied heritage in relation to the horse. Um, and also a, a vital genetic resource to preserve and um, nurture for the future. 
there's also potential on those smaller farm holdings to use equines in, in conservation grazing to allow us to manage grassland habitats, um, reducing maybe the need to manage by machine or, or by burning or all these other more impactful ways that sometimes lands are managed. Um, and I, look, I know you've got a, a very interesting presentation later on um, and you probably will hear more about how these animals and horses can be used uh, from Dawn uh, Laidlaw in terms of conservation grazing, but certainly, uh, you know, as part of the grazing process, the rank grass and the vegetation is consumed and it's trampled um, and it prevents that sort of scrub from taking over. Um, I suppose it's fair to say that these breeds used in, in this sort of conservation style grazing and management are our are, are native breeds. They, they tend to be probably smaller. They're better able, obviously, to cope with the climate. They're lighter on the ground. They're, they're maybe less um, selective in their grazing habits and they're ideal for, for those management purposes. So I think, I mean, from a sort of policy and um, perspective in Ireland, the approach really does need to be a combination of the carrot, certainly in terms of financial incentives and to support horse owners and farmers alike to adopt nature friendly practices on their farms. Um, but also maybe you do need to keep in mind the stick of regulation, you know, and um, if people are doing making doing significant damage to to landscapes and um, natural environments, then, you know, without permission and that needs to be tackled. And I think we've maybe not been brilliant, to be honest, in Ireland in tackling that, but we have been getting better in recent years. So that, again, that balance needs to be, be struck between that. Um, but again, awareness is so important. Um, I, I travel up and down the country um, in Ireland and I've, I've had trips abroad. And the, sometimes, you know, I will meet farmers, for example, and indeed some of them are horse owners who, you know, I would classify as, you know, very progressive and, and proactive on their farms, yet they may, it was news to them, for example, that a, a hedgerow only fruits on a, on a second year's growth. It'll only put flowers and berries on. Um, so sometimes awareness raising in, in you know, in, in just to get the message out there brings people on immensely. And that, that can't be um, forgotten about the importance of that. So really, I suppose I one particular interest I have um, is in soil health. Um, and certainly, you know, we've seen we see examples of, of absolute, you know, soil ruination um, in other parts of the world. Um, we're, we're fortunate enough, I think, in the UK and Ireland to have pretty OK soil, but it, it's not particularly going in the right direction. Um, and, you know, if we keep going the way we are, adopting the same old sort of practices where we're, we're, we're essentially degrading our, our growing medium and that's going to have long term devastating impacts. Um, so I the horse sector in particular, I think, has a role to play here, um, certainly in terms of um, maybe being able to reduce chemical inputs in their land management, but also things, as I said, like uh, anthelmintic use, just routinely doing it. Um, we do tend to use quite a lot of um, health products on our horses and um, that has an impact on, on that biodiversity beneath our feet. And if we start getting that wrong, uh, the, 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 the chain just doesn't hold together. Um, the, eco the ecological connections break down and we, we have to be cognizant of that. And um, the way that we can manage our, our fields and our paddocks on our, on our horse farms is, is critical. So really, just to suppose finish up, um, going back to that social license side of things of the equine industry, we really can't take it for granted. Um, I really believe that there are many positive stories out there um, and examples of what commercial stud farms in particular can do. I think we need to highlight those where they're happening and to encourage others to get involved. I mean, I've met with the Irish Thoroughbred Breeders Association here and I, they certainly get it and they have a good understanding that the thoroughbred sector in particular can, can play in supporting biodiversity and, and water quality. Um, and they are working on worthwhile proposals. So I think that that's positive. That That's good. Um, so I am excited um, about where the equine industry can go from here. I think it has a unique opportunity to embrace um, nature friendly farming practices and, and sustainable farming practices in maybe a way other agricultural sectors can't. Um, so let's, you know, I'm, I, 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 it, there's a challenge, no doubt, but I think there's an opportunity there. And, you know, let's see that we can 
be world class and continue to be world class breeders of horses here in Ireland, but in a way that enhances the lives, the landscape um, on which they and we all rely on. That way we can ensure that future generations inherit um, an Irish equestrian industry, an equine industry that's thriving, that's resilient, um, not only economically and socially, but environmentally too. So thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Minister, for that insightful perspective from the world of, of government. I was particularly taken with your, your descriptions of the funding schemes uh, on offer there. And we have a, a change of direction in, in our country as well, with public monies now being uh, used for public goods in that sort of environmental and agricultural setting. And your comments about soil health. Our EFRA Select Committee is just completing an inquiry on soil health. And that that is something that's so important for our environment moving forward. So please do stay with us, Minister. We've got a short period of time now for some questions. May I invite Ruth back onto the stage to take a seat? And we hopefully still have got um, Minister Hackett with us and also Dr. Alfonso Sen as well. So I think you've got a, you've got a mic. So what I will do is I'll alternate between um, the iPad and the auditorium. Um, for people in the auditorium, if you, when you, you can raise your hand and someone with a mic will come to you. And can I ask that you keep your questions brief and concise so we can get through a fair few. And when you um, ask your question, if you say who you are and, and where you're from as well, that would help. Um, I'll first of all take a question from the iPad and then I'll move to the floor. So the first question is that as climate changes, are there valuable management techniques we can learn from those keeping horses in more arid or climatically erratic areas? So I don't know which of the panel would like to take that. Alfonso, do, do you have any comments about what we need to learn in terms of, I guess, extreme weather conditions, the droughts that you face? Do you want to take that one? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, everyone. It is a great honor for me to carry the voice of uh, <laughs> the kinds of African pastoral areas. Uh, you know, population are way of the change in their natural uh, living conditions and have. Uh, always develop strategy for adopting to these climate upheavals. Uh, some techniques have uh, been uh, developed by breeders. Uh, first of all, uh, it uh, should be remembered that horses are uh, an integrated part of the pastoral farming system. Uh, they therefore adopt adaptation strategy for the survival of the herd in general. This strategy are herd mobility for the storage, forage scrapping, diverse stock diversification. This technique can be uh, classified as natural or internal directly adopted by farmers. Public policy has uh, intervened by increasing the number of watering points in uh, order to reduce the distance traveled by a kid. The availability of water remains a concern for pastoralists, despite the efforts made by the government. And an example of a uh, the pastoral unit of Chell, which cover a big area with uh, 63 village. There are 100 horses and 100 uh, donkeys. As for the little stock, there are 4,000 uh, chips in the borehards and water ponds in Chell. 
these small remnants no longer go to uh, the watering holes. Echidae in particular donkeys are used to transport 2 million a thousand liter of uh, water days for small ruminants. This is an example of uh, adaptation of this area in uh, Senegal. Thank you for very much. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I'll now move to a question from the floor. If someone would like to put, there's a gentleman there in the middle there. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Don Broom from Cambridge Veterinary School. Uh, one of the components of sustainability is the extent, the efficiency of the use of world resources. And it seems to me that horses have a particular advantage here in that horses can get the major part of their food from something which humans cannot eat. On the other hand, there are some horses being fed things which humans could eat or being fed things which are, which are using land, which could be used for human food production. So my general question is in two parts. One, to what extent do you think that is being talked about? Can, can, can we reduce the use of things which ought to be used for feeding humans directly? And secondly, when there is a, a pasture area, it's possible to grow plants which are high protein very often they are, sometimes they're, they're, they're herbs, clovers and things, sometimes they are shrubs, sometimes they are trees. That is a thing to do in the future, and we heard about Senegal and silver pastoral systems. How much is that going to, is, how much is that being done? What opportunities do you think there are for getting better protein from a wider range of species and not just grass? Thank you for that. I don't know who wants to try that one. Do you want to? I can, I, oh, am I, on? I can make a start, but I'm sure that um, Pippa will have a lot um, of important yeah. use of information about land use. I mean, that really comes to the heart of it. Um, land, as my father-in-law says, buy land, they're not making it anymore. It's, it is the commodity of the future, and we need to think really, really carefully about what we do. One of my clients said to me, I've got a patch of land. Should I put solar on it? Should I use it for growing crops? Should I plant trees? What should I do? Well, I would always say, what's the makeup of the land? What suits it best? What, what carbon potential is there in the land? What issues do you have in terms of water and runoff, etc., etc.? So to specifically answer your question, we may find that we have... <laughs> Having horses is a, is a luxury. Playing sport is a luxury as compared to needing to eat. You know, that's just a fact. So we may find in the future that we become under pressure um, for the land that we're using for, our, for our, our enjoyment. This is one of the many reasons why I'm so passionate about what you've said, sir, which is we need to make sure that the land that we're using, we are putting a variety of shrubs, trees, plants on there that will benefit the horse diet and welfare, but it will also benefit the ecosystem in that land. I want to be part of a sport that is known for being good for the environment because we are doing beneficial things to that land. Um, Pippa, I suspect you may wish to wade in. Yeah, Pippa, do you have some comments? There, I'm muted, unmuted now. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very valid question and certainly in the wider agricultural um, debate, it, it's something that crops up a lot, particularly in Ireland, because we rely on a lot of imported feed um, from other countries to feed not only our horses, but our, our livestock as well. Um, I think it is important to, to make the point that not it's not always possible to grow a grain that's of a calibre for human use. You know, there's always a certain percentage that really wouldn't make the grade for human, you know, human use and therefore it should it's best probably used through another mechanism and, and maybe horses are, are one of those. Um, and certainly we're doing a lot of work as well in terms of that sort of multi-species with herbs, um, you know, trying to support um, people to grow things like red clover silage. So you're growing your own high protein um, feed on farm. Um, I'm not, I, I know that, um, and I just know from our a couple of horses, we keep ourselves in our own farm and we do grow, you know, different multi-species swords and they, they, they seem to quite like it. Horses, uh, in my opinion, have always liked to eat different things. You know, their heads are always stuck in the hedge and um, so they might well respond very well to a sort of a higher protein 
um, feed input that could be maybe grown on on farm. And as you say, it's a it's a it's a crop that humans couldn't eat, and 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 that would be great. I'm not sure, and maybe somebody more more um, informed than me would know about things like um, high protein silage or or um, arable silages. Are are they, are they okay to to feed to horses? Um, you know, certainly for for livestock, they are. Um, but you know we, we do import a lot of, of feed for our horses as well and you know there is that debate and i think ruth um highlighted it there in terms of the it's it is a luxury and it is it's something that we enjoy in terms of our, our horses um but it's not a necessity so we do need to be careful there but i think it'd be interesting to see if there is any further work in terms of uh, displacing some um grains from from horse diets and replacing them with sort of um a fodder based high protein feed Thank you very much, thank you. We've now come to the quick fire round. We've got two to three minutes left, so I'm gonna sort of fire just a couple of quick questions at, at the panelists. Um, firstly, to Ruth from the iPad then. Thanks to Ruth for simplifying, this is from Jan Rogers, for simplifying the actions people can take as, as a result of, of her work. Briefly, will there be an industry action plan as the result of the report? Yes. Great, I like <laughs> Great, okay, so quick question from the floor. Yep, over here. Hi, uh, Jenna Hegarty from the Donkey Sanctuary. Um, whether this is quick, who knows? Uh, working animals are clearly hugely important right now in many parts of the world. Does the panel feel that working equines are a technology of the past that should be ultimately phased out or an integral part of a sustainable, net zero, nature positive human development world? Okay, so a question the latter. on... Okay. <laughs> All right, good quick answer, thank you, thank you. Alfonso, the, the future of working animals, um, is it, it, it's so important in your part of the world. We'll take that as a yes, yep, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, another quick question from the, uh, the iPad. Horses fall between companion animals and livestock. So in terms of sort of policy and decision making and, and how we, we operate, how can we ensure visibility of horses' needs alongside their potential to help deliver solutions? I don't know whether, Pippa, do you want to quickly try that well, that's, one? That's a, that's, that is a tough one in, in a sense, but I think again, it's if we can display um, to, to the general public and, and other policymakers that the horses have a valuable role and, and managing sport horses, thoroughbreds, bloodstock in enterprises, stud farms in a way that delivers for those sort of social goods that we, we so crave now in terms of environmental um, benefits and water and biodiversity and all that. Then, then we really sort of stand out. And in one sense, it's good to maybe generate a little bit of competition between the sectors. You know, if, if the horse sector starts pulling its weight, then it, you know, the, the spotlight then moves to another agricultural sector and maybe it rises all boats. I'd like to think that. Okay, thank you very much. And the final quick question to, to, to Ruth, just a quick fire list, if you could give us in terms of what equine businesses can do to make themselves more environmentally friendly. If you can give us uh, two or three things to say, look, this is what you can do, easy things to do or easy wins. Yeah, absolutely. And first, I'd very quickly like to say that the big thing that Ireland's got right is they have closely associated horse sport with agriculture, something that Britain can definitely learn from. But in return, uh, in reply to your questions, um, Fundamentally, it is about mindset. So one of the big things we do is we embed a procurement policy into a business. Sounds really boring, it's really straightforward. Number one, do I need the item I'm about to buy? Number two, can I buy it, can I rent it rather than buy it? Number three, when I buy the item, what am I going to do with it at the end? Just go through that simple filter process will actually eradicate a huge amount of the nonsense waste that we buy and throw away so quickly. So that would be number one for businesses. Uh, number two, look at your energy consumption. If you're a big business that can afford it, put a, big, a building management system in place. If you're a small business, just simply put a switch off system. So any switches that must never be switched off, just stick a big red blob next to it saying, never switch me off. Everything else should be switched off when not in use. Um, when I, I'm lucky enough to work with York Racecourse, they reduced their impact by 70% just by doing this. Huge, huge impact that didn't require any money, and anyone can do it, particularly if you're in a stable yard. Um, and the third one is talk, 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 talk to your staff. Over-talk, irritate them. 
about the topic, get them beyond the pain point into the point where they accept that it's normal because the staff in any organization, whether that's stable hands filling up and overfilling buckets of water or managers procuring IT systems, everyone is impacting on the environment. So if they understand that the environment is a fundamental part of the way that business operates, they're doing the work for you. Thank you very much. Well, that's all we've got time for in that session, and we're going to have a, a quick break for coffee. I'm looking to Rolly now in terms of the timings that we will return to the theatre at five past uh, 12. So here in the theatre, you can find refreshments out the door and up the stairs, while our virtual guests can grab a quick of whatever you like um, before you are treated to three fascinating online presentations about how the changing environment is affecting World Horse Welfare's work. Remember to keep the conversation going on X, and thank you to all of our presenters this morning. Please enjoy a cup of tea or coffee, and we'll see you back at five past 12 UK time.
Forces, people and the environment have always been intertwined, but in the modern world these links can weaken and risk becoming disconnected. A driver for us taking action to make our farms more sustainable is the strengthening of these links in the belief that what is good for nature and the environment is good for the welfare of our horses and for us as well. Our work started a few years ago as a working group made up of people from across the organisation with an interest in sustainability. Since then we've worked to understand in what ways the charity is both a friend and a foe to the environment and have researched ideas to help us shift the balance. This year we've run small projects at each farm that look to address different angles of sustainability with a view to building on these in the years to come. Each of our four farms are different in terms of their environment, where they're situated in the country, what type of soil they have, what weather they experience and whether they're flat or hilly. This means that the flora and fauna that can thrive is different at each farm. Bellwade Farm in Aberdeenshire in particular heralds unique opportunities for habitat cultivation and this has been the focus of our efforts up there this year. You just thought let's do a bio blitz which is basically it's, it's whether it's a one day event or whatever we decided to do a year and collectively all the staff and we try and encourage the visitors as well just anyone that sees or hears or anything to take a picture, take a video, take a sound recording and send it in and so we've recorded every living thing. So it's every form of plant. I've gone around and photographed and documented every type of tree in the site. Um, we photographed lots of flowers with the idea. We've got it all on record. It's just over time we'll get it identified. Um, birds and butterflies and mammals. So it's, it's really, and this is, I think it's a starting point, or it's a good starting point, is actually just understanding what is on the site already. And then building on that is looking at, in the case here, where we've discovered we've got Kentish Glory, which nationwide is a very rare moth, almost exclusive to a couple of areas in Scotland. And here at Bellweed, we've we've trapped them for the last two years. So we know we're on the fringe. We are probably the most easterly fringe of the Kentish Glory population in Britain, or North Eastley. And we know they rely very heavily on regenerating birch. Maybe in a far, farm management plan, consider um, preparing some areas and let the birch regenerate to try and enhance that population of Kentish glories. Um, it's almost like, you know, manicuring and, and micromanaging this site is almost just putting barriers up to stop the wildlife. And the wildlife is here, and the wildlife, it doesn't need that much encouragement to come in and, and, and you know, step into the, into the farm. It's almost like a, a fringe, you know, the, they always say, wildlife thrives on where the habitat changes so it's i see right in the heart of the farm is quite a little bit but certainly around the fringe where we've got the river we've got woodland um and, and we've got the crops on the other side so you've actually got variation in habitat all around this site and it's on each of those fringes you get different wildlife thriving so it's it's almost like yeah if we don't try so hard to, to manage it if we ease off a bit and just let the edges um go a bit more natural then the wildlife will come back. It's it's like everything. We don't we don't need to make much of an effort. If anything, we need to make less of an effort. You can be proactive in the fact of putting up, say, barn owl nest boxes or bird boxes for for all the birds. There's all sorts of stuff you can do for insects. Just leaving, you know, even just have a brush piles when any trees come down. It doesn't have to be at the site, but somewhere on the farm, have a site where you just have brush pile, like the dung pile here, is always a haven for wildlife. I'm seeing a red squirrel here as well, so that's, that's made my morning. The second area of focus for our projects this year has been rainwater capture. We use a lot of water for drinking and bathing the horses, for washing down equipment and inside of our visitor centres. Here at Hall Farm in Norfolk, we reside in the driest part of the country, so it was the perfect place to see what we could do to reduce our water consumption. So managing horses, we use a lot of water. So every field has its own water tank. Some fields are so big they need two. Um, the horses are drinking a lot all through the day and night. We use the water around the farm for keeping everything clean. So washing all the equipment, cleaning out the stables as part of our biosecurity. Um, we also use the water in our visitor centres um, and also in the heat, we need extra water. So in the summer, we when it's really hot, we're washing the horses down twice a day, every day, um, just to try and keep them cool. 
So last year, because it was so dry, um, the fields didn't really grow much grass, so we had to give extra hay um, to all of the fields. We're on sandy soil here in Norfolk, which also affects how we graze our horses. So it was a lot more of field rotation, um, moving the horses between the paddocks, but also trying to keep them in the shade and cool, cool all day. So at the moment we're in the process of installing a rain water tank so it will catch all the water that runs off the visitor centre roof and store it in a tank so we can then use it for flushing the toilets in the visitor centre. Mm. So when we're open to the public um, on our busy days we can have over 100 visitors come through the doors. When they're flushing the toilets that can use up to 5 to 10 litres of water per flush so that will be thousands of litres of water saved. Um, every time we have the public in to visit us. At the opposite end of the scale to the flat dryness of Hall Farm is Glenda Spooner Farm, located in the wetter and hillier southwest of the country. Most people are well aware of the benefits of tree and hedge planting to sequester carbon and to provide habitat for wildlife. But we are planting at Glenda Spooner Farm this year for more reasons than you might think. Right at the top of our farm, we've got about 30 or 40 acres of really open, exposed, pasture. Um, it's electric fenced on all four sides so it's a pretty bland environment for the horses and it's really open and exposed from a wildlife point of view as well. Uh, one of the things we're acutely aware of because the horses are generally up there in winter because the ground drains pretty well and doesn't get too boggy um, but obviously it's, it can be bitterly cold, it's pretty open and exposed and because the horses are grazing that area in winter invariably their land ends up quite bare um, so of course when we get these heavy um, showers like flash flooding almost type conditions that we're seeing as our environment um, as our weather patterns appear to be changing um, we're noticing that obviously we're also getting more runoff from that area we want to do as much as we can to make that better to enrich their environment and provide them as well as with their their man-made shelters and their windbreaks and their hay feeders that they already have access to and they're hard standing we'd like to, to in, introduce more natural hedgerows um, some some trees which obviously will mature over time and also make the environment so much more diverse and interesting um, but also provide a, a much much better habitat in the more exposed areas for our small mammals and birds and invertebrates um, and we really hope that by planting a fairly extensive hedgerow and some trees that will mature over time that that runoff will be reduced um, which in turn is better for soil health and grass regeneration um, as well as equine enrichment. For our last project we wanted to try something a bit radical Having heard that the Helsinki Horse Show is powered by electricity generated entirely by horse manure, we wanted to see what our manure at Penny Farm in Lancashire might be able to do for us. So what we're going to do, we're going to make some uh, bricks that we can burn in a log burner using purely um, horse droppings, bedding that we've taken out of the stables and water which we've got from the, the rain. And you have to let these dry out for a few months um, and then we're going to burn them in the log burner so that we can heat the farmhouse uh, purely from sustainable materials. This has been a snapshot of some of the sustainability initiatives we've been working on this year. We hope that as our understanding of how our horses and their environment interact in mutually beneficial ways, we can make continued improvements that will benefit both the environment and the welfare of our horses which after all is why we're here. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm one of the regional coordinators for World Horse Welfare here in Latin America. Environmental issues are of big concern everywhere in the world, especially climate change. In this video presentation, you see a collage of the initiatives projects are working on in Latin America, Asia, and in Africa in regards to environmental uh, sustainability and building resilience for climate change. We are especially highlighting the role of work in equids and how they support our communities build resilience for this matter. Hola, soy Romel Rosas, coordinador del programa de bienestar equino en Panamá, FUCAEP, Fundación para la Capacitación y Asistencia Equina en Panamá. Nosotros en Panamá estamos trabajando por la sostenibilidad de las comunidades y lo hacemos a través de la capacitación continua de los dueños de caballos y el desarrollo de habilidades de estas personas, eh, de estos propietarios de caballos, ya que ellos viven en comunidades que pueden estar aisladas por el tema del río, 
este cambio climático ha hecho al, algunas afectaciones y pueden ellos quedar atrapados o eh, distantes por algunos días por el aumento del tamaño del volumen de caudal del río. Y nosotros trabajamos para poder que ellos puedan aprender un poco más y darles las herramientas necesarias para cuidar sus caballos eh, de forma adecuada. Por eso nos trasladamos hasta las comunidades, eh, que muchas veces son comunidades muy distantes, pero que vale la pena al final eh, ir porque eh, logramos el objetivo, logramos la enseñanza, logramos capacitar a las personas, logramos mejorar la calidad de vida de los caballos y esto en Panamá es muy bueno porque el caballo sigue siendo una herramienta de trabajo o sigue siendo la principal actor en la ayuda del, de, la, de las personas, sobre todo para sustentar o traer alimentos a las casas y como ingreso económico para las familias. Monjaraz es una de las aldeas más grandes del municipio de Marcovia, en la cual muchos barrios, colonias y caseríos no cuentan con un tren de aseo. Por lo que Equinos de Honduras y la Municipalidad de Marcovia está en proceso de desarrollo de un proyecto de recolección de desechos a través de los caballos de trabajo, ya que son una fuerza bastante importante para las personas en las comunidades, que en muchos casos son personas de escasos recursos. Este proyecto viene a beneficiar porque crearía fuentes de empleo, mejoraría la calidad de vida de las personas ya que obtendrían un ingreso económico para suplir sus necesidades básicas. El medio, habría una mejora en el medio ambiente ya que el manejo de los desechos sería de una manera más ordenada y sistemática y habría un impacto positivo en el tema de bienestar animal porque siempre se vela por el bienestar de todos. Qué gusto, mi nombre es... Parvin Álvarez, pertenezco a, al grupo de cocheros de Monjaraz y estamos en una institución que nos representa, que son equinos de Honduras, siempre con el apoyo de la alcaldía de Marcovia y estamos viendo un proyecto bien, que son la recolectación de desechos de la aldea de Monjaraz y nosotros somos aproximadamente unos 25, 25, 26 personas que subsistimos a lo que es el rubro de, del coche. Nosotros vemos a bien el proyecto que venga a venir para seguirle dando seguimiento siempre de la mano con el Quino de Honduras y de la alcaldía de, de Marcovia. Mi nombre es Lisa Ortuño, soy la directora ejecutiva de CRU, Costa Rica Equine Welfare. Es una organización que trabaja por el bienestar de los equinos de trabajo, caballos, burros y mulas en Costa Rica, en las diferentes comunidades. En esta ocasión pues tenemos una alianza nueva, estratégica, con la Cruz Roja Costarricense y con ellos tenemos un proyecto muy interesante con el Departamento de Gestión de Riesgos en donde estamos trabajando con la comunidad en la parte de sensibilización, concientización, educación, con temas de bienestar animal, más toda la parte del medio ambiente y lo importante que es ese marco de una sola salud, en donde los seres humanos, los animales y el medio ambiente estamos todos interconectados y es importantísimo que todos tengamos bienestar. Hola, soy Marcela Rodríguez, soy voluntaria en la Cruz Roja Costarricense, pertenezco al área de gestión de riesgos en Punta Arenas. En este momento tenemos una alianza estratégica firmada mediante convenio entre Costa Rica Equina y Welfare y la Cruz Roja Costarricense. Equina y Welfare es una asociación que busca mejorar la vida de los equidos de trabajo en todo el país. La implementación del proyecto se pretende desarrollar en la zona sur y la Cruz de Guanacaste a través del área de gestión de riesgos mediante la línea de salud comunitaria. Se implementarán herramientas como el análisis de vulnerabilidades y capacidades en la Garita de la Cruz. Desde nuestra organización estaremos felices de ver la alianza estratégica contribuyendo con el bienestar humano y el bienestar animal. Uh, 
खेती गर खेत कर जे हो अजिलो हम दोसों सीजन हो पैला सीजन में मकई रोपे थे मकई पी अब जानवर लाना भो रेला खाना भो अब इस पाली को धान के धान भी अब दुबईला हो चामल मंला हो चोकर भूसी चाह जानवर ने हो रहा एवटा कुरा के सब भाग पैला वहाँ चाह घास काटना जानवर को लगी घास काटना धौ धौ हो अब कस को खेत में जाने के करने अलग सामूहिक खेती अब आप खेत में घास घास अब जी सक आप खेत में काटना सकता रो खेती अब मंला मं रानवर को वेलफेयर को लगी एकदम सहयोग खेती Cartels Protection Association, Cape Town, South Africa, serves and protects 260 working cart horses and their owners living on the Cape Flats. These working cart horses can be seen traversing the streets of Cape Town, pulling a four-wheel flatbed cart, collecting scrap metal, garden refuse, old furniture, electrical appliances, and any other item that the cart horse owners can exchange for cash. The scrap metal that the owners collect is they break it down into different grades of metal, and then they take it down to the local scrapyard. Where it enters the recycling ch chain, um, this then contributes very positively to the environment because it saves energy, uh, reduces the demand for fossil fuels, and also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It also um, prevents it from ending up in a landfill where it can pollute the water and the air and the soil. The garden refuse collected by the cultures owners is taken down to the municipal waste site where it's chipped and used in the manufacturing of compost. This re reduces the need for new landfills and also reduces the use of chemical fertilizer which can pollute water and harm wildlife. Old and broken furniture and appliances are taken to dealers who specialize in, re in the repair and reselling of these items. This means that these items are not thrown away and end up in landfills where they can produce harmful emissions and also they save on the energy and the resources that it would take to manufacture new ones. Last but not least, using a horse and cart instead of a fuel vehicle reduces greenhouse gas emissions which contributes to global warming and climate change. The cart horses have a low carbon footprint. They conserve our natural resources, improve air quality and reduce noise pollution. The cart horse owners are a tiny part of the global community but together with their horses they simply and effectively reduce our environmental footprint and they make a positive difference in the world. Hello, my name is uh, Collins Masiwa, the clinic veterinarian for the Bain Beach Doggy Health and Animal Warfare Center in Zimbabwe. And today I'm joined by Mr. Eriksen, a farmer in the city of the How many donkeys do you have said? 28. 28 donkeys. Yes. Um, what do you do to survive in a drought or a dry climate as a farmer? Like you have seen this, the, this I put my, if my donkeys are uh, now experiencing drought, I just take them and put them in my field so that they can play inside here. What do you feed your donkeys? During a drought or in dry climate, I usually feed the, the farm, the crops that we after we plant. There are my mashanga, not the shishu, mashanga, the longoja mashanga. The ma magwa here in the farm. So you have adapted to living in a dry climate. Yeah, that's what I have to. So how do how do your donkeys help you with living or surviving in a dry climate? But, but, but they are major. They are the main transports because they farm crops and I take them to the town and this for the donkey is go charge. These are my transports. So what crops do you usually farm? Uh, right crops to the farm during a drought. And uh, what are the ways of getting through the dry spells? What, what are the ways that you do to get through the dry spell or the drought? Uh, for the animals, just put them inside. Yes, I mean, this is the, 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 the
this place is because all the grazes don't is on no cows, no one. Just the reserve of grazes. Would you need any help from us? Let me in a drought or anything like that. Yes, you can, you can help us for the that we can farm the supplement. In this video, you saw a summary of where our projects all across the world are working on in regards of building climate resilience and fighting climate change. We also saw what the role of working equity is in such matter. We hope that you enjoyed it and that this video serves as a platform for debate. Thanks for watching. Hello, everybody. Every year, I try my best to get to London and participate in this very important conference. But unfortunately, Due to the voting session in the European Parliament, I speak to you from Brussels, in the heart of Europe. This year's conference topic, Horses and the Environment, is more important than ever. We see that the rollout of the European Green Deal really translates into legislation here in the Parliament. As president of the MEP Horse Group, and together with my colleagues, we really try to demonstrate that horses are a green asset for Europe. Equine riding activities meet the recognition of many functions of agriculture. The European Commission wants to promote diversification and land preservation. The horse sector can bring all that. Equines present many green assets. I'm going to give just a few examples. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions and they contribute to the preservation of the biodiversity. In the context of the revision of the European legislation on animal welfare, there are words that the European Commission is probably postponing the text to the next legislation, even though I think it's a missed opportunity of this Commission to not revise it this year as planned. The MEP Horse Group, together with the European Horse Network, has worked to really put out a vision to include the Queens in the proposal with all its precision. This would be possible with specific delegated and implementing regulations focused exclusively on equines. Future rules must improve health and welfare without introducing too many, too strict and too expensive conditions that have little to no benefit for horses' welfare. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I also want to take the opportunity to present a positive legislative review as chair of the MEP Horse Group. Together with other MEPs and the European Horse Network, we really made a difference in this legislation. First, there was a success in the preservation of antibiotics for animals for their health and welfare. As one of my own horses, Iceman, fell ill this year, I'm even more aware how important this can be for horses and animals in general for an inclusive and full treatment. Second, there was a strong promotion of equine for the biodiversity inside the CAP and Green Deal. I always remind everyone that horses are pasture animals and belong in agriculture areas. Third, as a member of the Temporary Committee on Animal Transport, I made sure that the requirements and expectations could also meet reality. This was certainly important for the equestrian sports and breeding industry. As you can see, we really put in the work for our horses. But the work is far from done. As the elections are coming up next year, I want to devote myself to another term where I can defend the rights and needs of horses. And of course, the people who like horses. The European horse sector is extremely important with 7 million horses in Europe and around 800,000 chops. We are known for world-class horses. I think we need more visibility in the parliament and in legislation. And I will work for that in the coming years. But of course, I cannot do that alone. We need dialogue with every relevant stakeholder to help ensure legislation is moving forward. That is why I want to thank the European Horse Network for bringing together all those stakeholders and talk about important issues to improve the sector. It's with great pleasure that I co-host these meetings with them.
Without further ado, I want to wish you all an interesting and fruitful conference. Hopefully, I can be there in person next year. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you had a nice cup of coffee or tea and a sticky bun. Um, and I hope you enjoyed uh, the online presentations, if you are remote as well, um, about how the environment and sustainability is affecting World Horse Welfare's work. Now, to get us back into the swing of things, we would like once again to sample your views. Um, here is the second poll, which you can complete on Slido by clicking on the poll on the top right-hand corner. So the question is, when should the needs of the environment outweigh the needs of the horse-human relationship? So the options are always, environmental considerations should be a top priority. Sometimes, both the environment and the horse-human relationship should be considered to make a balanced decision, or never, the horse-human relationship should always be prioritized. So we'll have a look at your answers a little bit later on. So I'd now like to introduce our next two speakers who will provide yet another perspective on horses and the environment, this time here in the United Kingdom. The first is Carol Laidlaw, a lead grazing ranger working for the National Trust at one of Britain's oldest and most biodiverse nature reserves, Wiccan Fen in East Anglia. Here, ponies are a vital part of a managed system of conservation, and Carol will explain why and how it all works. Thank you, Carol. Hello, everyone. My name is Carol, and I'm the grazing ranger from Wiccan Fen National Nature Reserve in the east of England. Wiccan Fen is a wetland reserve situated on the fens of eastern England. And I'm here to talk to you today, and apologies for not being there in person, about the conservation grazing system that we have running there and have, have had running since 2001. My initial role at Wiccan was involved in the Heritage Lottery funded scrub clearance project we had running back then, but my main role since 2001 has been to oversee the management and growth of the extensive grazing project that also started in 2001. Wiccan is a very unique and special place. It is approximately 25 kilometres north of Cambridge and our current land holding co covers 805 hectares. The National Trust bought the first 0 0.8 hectares in 1899 and the reserve has continued to increase in size since then with our most recent purchase of 25 hectares occurring a couple of months ago. Approximately half of this area is grazed with our own stock. As I said, it's a very unique and special place. 
we have over 9,000 different species recorded there. And it has several legally recognized, legally recognized designations. It's a national nature reserve. It's a site of special scientific interest. It's a special area of conservation and it's also a Ramsar site. It's a very unique and rare habitat. Most of the species are in the small details, beetles, moths and flies. We've got more flies than you can shake a stick at, but it is an incredibly wonderful place to come and visit and to work in. As is common globally, internationally, nationally, and in everybody's local area, Wiccan faces a number of challenges. Climate change, agricultural intensification, flooding, water control, drainage, carbon storage, all of these things also threaten the welfare of the Little Nature Reserve. These challenges to the natural environment aren't news. They've been recognized for many, many years. And as I said, Wiccan hasn't escaped these effects. We embarked upon the Wiccan Fen vision in 1999. We're nearly 25 years into it now. And over the next 100 years, we aim to create, create a 53 square kilometer nature reserve adjacent to and including the NNR. Stretching down from Wiccan village at the top middle of the map that you see in front of you, all the way down to Cambridge was is at the bottom pointy end of that triangle. We plan to use open-ended ecological restoration techniques to create and restore wildlife habitats on previously intensively farmed arable land. We want to establish shifting vegetation mosaics using factors such as water control and low intensity grazing provided by large herbivores. The light green areas on the map are the areas that we hope to either buy or work in partnership with other businesses, farmers and landowners, landowners to farm and work the land in a more nature friendly fashion if possible. The dark green areas are the areas that we already own and that are already part of our vision project. The addition of large herbivores is one of the critical factors in the success of this long term vision to create a varied, flexible and dynamic ecosystem. From a period in 2001 to 2005, we introduced conic ponies and highland cattle to help graze this area and help manage the evolving landscape. We chose these species and these breeds because we felt that they would give us the best results for our management system and the goals that we wanted to achieve of having a natural, flexible and dynamic landscape that the animals were an integral part of. Traditional conservation grazing tends to utilize controlled numbers of animals of the same sex, possibly a similar age range for a limited period to achieve prime conditions for targeted species or a range of species. At Wiccan, we use mixed species, mixed age, mixed sex grazing year round to create a flexible range of habitats that flux and change over time. We want and encourage the animals to become an integral part of the evolving landscape. So we use minimal husbandry techniques to try and reduce our influence on where they graze, rest, drink or play. We first introduced our grazing animals to our site in 2001 and breeding animals were reduced in 2003. We introduced Highland cattle with eight founder members and conic ponies, 13 founder members, as our research and inf information indicated that these were the breeds best suited to our site and proposed management. The cattle and horses are managed under an intensive, minimal management system. While upholding current welfare laws and moral moral obligations, common husbandry practices found in domestic or commercial systems, such as the regular administration of prophylactics for worm control, hoof trimming or supplementary feeding are rarely undertaken. The animals live out in their grazing units year round. They have access to a wide variety of forage and browse throughout their home range and the grazing ratios range from 1.25 hectares per head to 5 hectares per head. 
Within their grazing units, the animals have considerable freedom to determine where they will graze, rest and drink. Occasionally, the animal's range will be restricted for management reasons or for other works. Animals form their own social groups. The establishment of naturalistic social dynamics is welcomed. As you can see here in this slide, we have a herd of horses here and they're split into different family groups. So although they move around the area as one herd, there are distinct units within this herd. Every animal is in checked every day. We do daily welfare checks and animals with welfare issues are monitored to determine how they're coping. If they're not coping, we discuss our options with the vet and then we undertake any necessary actions. Cattle and horses are permitted to breed freely, although population control is of course a concern and is something that we work with extensively. And we're embarking upon a number of projects in the next two to five years um, to control the expanding herd of breeding horses. The biggest impact, obviously, with introducing grazing herds is the vegetation removal through their grazing. Animals with differing nutritional requirements obviously require different things to graze and will utilize the land in different ways. And this is encouraged. But the social and breeding behaviour of the mixed herds brings another level of complexity and variety to the landscape. And this is incredibly important to us. Things like a hoof print or a bull pit dug by a bull can be utilised by invertebrates or can open up the seed bank um, or for sunning areas or something like that. The social dynamics of the herds are really important to us and adds another level of variety and complexity to the evolving landscape. We want to create a patchwork quilt of habitats from the value of having a small hoof print that fills with water that can act as a tiny ephemeral pool for some insects. The social behaviours of the ponies and the cattle is giving us a huge amount of dynamism and variety in our landscape. We have seen many things change and we wouldn't be able to achieve this without the actions of our breeding herds of horses and cattle. Thank you very much for your attention and for listening to me today. I hope you've enjoyed my talk and please do feel free when the time is right to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. It's so important to know that horses and ponies can play such a role in, in helping manage our natural environments so long as, as we manage them prudently. So we're going from a nature reserve to something more familiar to many of us, a yard. So what does a more sustainable horse yard look like? We're going to hear from Jenny Rogers, manager and trustee of Ash Rescue Centre, where she cares for 32 healthy elderly horses while sustaining the natural wildlife friendly environment. Over to you, Jenny. Hello. When we set up ASH over 10 years ago, our simple aim was to try to create an environment that was both sustainable and beneficial to horses as well as wildlife. What we went on to discover was there's an incredibly important connection between having a healthy, natural environment and having healthy, balanced horses. When we choose to prioritise one living thing over others, we fail to truly help anything or anyone in the long term. Thankfully, nature is very forgiving. And simply by making a few small changes, we can all make an enormous difference. Here is a short video of our work so far.
Using the principle of the three S's, this is how we began developing our previously farmed land. We're all familiar with stress and the need to reduce it, but how much emphasis do we place on the stressed land that we provide for our horses? Soil stress plays an important role in maintaining a healthy horse. Is your land compacted or overgrazed? Is it lacking in nutrients? Is it full of unwanted invasive plants? Or is it toxic from chemical fertilizers, wormers and sprays? How can we expect our horses to feel well when their only option is to graze sick fields? Your land is not merely a financial asset. The soil and the plants are as much responsibility to you as your horses that graze upon it. It needs as much attention and care as you give your horses, and yet it seldom receives it. And because of this, everything suffers. Space. Space is not merely about quantity, it's quality, or rather equality, a space for everything to have a chance to evolve. Everything from a plant to a tree to a bird to a bee. Everything needs a little space in order to thrive. So we asked a question. What would happen if we take our, some of our well-manicured, green, clean paddocks and gave it over to the untidy natural world? Or as my daughter used to call it, the wilderness. Sustainability. It is estimated here in the UK we have over one million acres of paddocks, but sadly much of it is currently not wildlife friendly. So how do we go about creating and maintaining these wild areas? There are five main factors we like to add to each of our field so that each field essentially becomes its own diverse ecosystem. One, let your grass grow, or is sometimes known as standing hay. This simply implies leaving your meadow grass long and grazing it off once it's gone over, or strip feeding it slowly in the summer when the seeds are ready and at their most nutritious. This process cuts down on machinery usage. Cutting less hay means less fuel consumption and less soil compaction. It leaves valuable wildlife habitats over winter for insects, mice, and voles, which in turn feed the apex predators like owls, buzzards, and foxes. In summer, it gives safe, sp safe spaces to our ground nesting birds, which are in serious decline. Keeping a good pasture height has a significant effect on building and maintaining healthy soil and grass recovery times. It is needed for moisture retention, adding nutrients, whilst the greater diversity of plants your pasture contains, the greater the diversity of microbes and fungi you have. The old saying, take your horses off the land before you can see their feet, now starts to make more sense. Flowers. We all need more flowers. We plant small wildflower meadows or hospital fields, as they were known, in corners or strips of every field. These areas are fenced off and allowed to grow, flower, seed, and then the seed disperse into the rest of the fields. This availability of flowering plants makes a big difference to pollinating insects. Not only do these areas have benefits to the wildlife, our horses can have supervised access to the healing plants as and when they are needed. Three, we plant hedges. Our native hedges are amazing. They're obviously a great field divider. They provide fantastic shelter for horses in all weathers. They can help prevent rainwater runoff. Their deep roots bring up stored minerals. They're home to hundreds, if not thousands, of birds, mammals, and insects. They help species move through the countryside from one habitat to another, used as commuter routes for foraging and roosting. And again, they can also be a natural medicine cabinet for our horses. 100 metres of our native hedgerow is home to roughly 20,000 caterpillars, which are a vital food source for our struggling songbird chicks and predatory insects. But sustainability also includes maintenance. Badly timed hedge cutting is a major issue for our countryside. The early cut takes out the much needed flowers, whilst the late cut takes out the overwintering habitats and essential food sources like berries and nuts. Laying our hedges keeps them healthy, thick, and providing everything our horses and wildlife need throughout the year. Four, water is life. So where possible, create a pond. Open water is amazing for all wildlife. Two thirds of Britain's freshwater plants and animals can be found in ponds. But horses also love ponds, as you have seen from the video. Finally, most importantly, turn your horses' stables and outbuildings into wildlife havens. Add bird boxes, bat boxes, leave log piles, or build bug hotels. Cover some compost heaps for the lizards, snakes and slow worms, or add green roofs and herb pots for the bees and butterflies. Here at Ash, we're embarking on our latest project, which is a large-scale equine and wildlife facility. It will be built with locally sourced and sustainable materials, no concrete and very limited plastic usage. It will be run with solar and biogas energy, so the animal waste will be used to power the buildings. We will have 250 square metres of green roof space, built-in insect towers, bird boxes, and large maternity bat roosts. Rainwater will be collected, filtered, stored, and then used. 
Overflow ponds and native planting schemes designed not just for the wildlife, but with medicinal plants, again for the horses. And lastly, in our experience, there are a few important lessons that we've learned along the way. Yellow rattle. Advised by many as a quick way to create a wildflower meadow, however, we have found that this small, semi-parasitic plant has actually caused more issues to our meadows by killing off wildflowers such as knapweed, vetch, and some of our lovely grasses. And as horses will not graze it, it soon becomes a problem. If you want to combine wildflower meadows and horses, our advice is do not use yellow rattle. Where possible, we remove the horses, not the dung. A broad statement, and obviously it's not always possible, to rotate in rest fields regularly. But if your environment is working, your dung should be broken down and composted within a few weeks. If your dung sits undisturbed, then either it is unhealthy or your environment is. Healthy dung is hugely important to the health of the ecosystem. For us, birds are the new sheep. We helped increase our bird numbers. The more we helped increase our bird numbers on the farm, the lower our worm counts became. On the other hand, our experience with rotational sheep grazing over many years actually didn't seem to make much difference to the worm counts. We have a few theories behind this, but we're still very much in the research stage and hope to have some answers on this in the future. We used to provide lots of feed balances, supplements and herbal mixtures to keep our oldies happy. But as our land has slowly improved, our horses have needed and wanted much less. Now they're obviously finding much of what they need from their environment. So not only does plant diversity help wildlife, it makes a huge difference to your horse's health too. Today, I've talked about how you can help wildlife, and I've only touched on the benefits to our horses. But in reality, these benefits are huge. Horses are foragers. They need to eat a varied diet of many herbs, barks, berries, and roots. In an ideal world, they'll eat roughly 50 different plants a day, but most are now lucky if they get five. Plants can do everything, from boosting immune systems and detoxing bodies to healing sprains and wounds. We call this medicine. This is a huge subject that I think deserves more discussions, time and attention. But we should all agree that prevention is always far better than cure. And as Wallace Black Elk once said, you don't have to heal the earth, she can heal herself. All you have to do is stop making her sick. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jenny, for that practical and really helpful presentation and for that beautiful video at the start. Um, so we're going to have a quick um, Q&A session again now. So Jenny is here with us with a, with a mic, and Carol hopefully will be joining us online again. Um, and again, what I'll do is I'll alternate between the auditorium and uh, the iPad. So. Um, Great, we've got everyone now. So first question from the iPad first is, is directed to Carol. What measures do you use briefly to, to monitor the well-being of your herd? As I mentioned in my talk, um, we go out and check every individual um, every day. All of the animals are individually known and recognized, and we keep very extensive records on the health and welfare of each animal as we record it every day. Much. Right, I'll go to the floor now. Um, it's a question towards the front here. And again, if you could keep your questions brief and, and also say who you are and where you're from, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Stephen Paget from the National Horse Racing College. Um, Jenny, fantastic. What an inspiring tale. But the one question is both somebody who has um, uh, land and uh, uh, opportunity at home, but as well as at the college, how do you fund that? Ask my partner. <laughs> um, we have a wedding venue on site. We, we fund it, however. I mean, to be honest, what we found, last year we got through 30 round bales of hay for effectively 35 horses. That was all we used. So actually by saving the grass, we've actually saved a huge amount of money. Um, also, our vet bills are really low. <laughs> that helps. Um, so yeah. It, it funds itself really well. Thank you very much. Um, a question now from, from um, online. How do you tackle the uneven and unnatural honeypot grazing pressure on sites where supplementary feeding is added in wintertime? How do you manage that? I don't know if... Carol, do you want to...? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. 
Um, yes, it's for us, we tend not to have that problem. Um, we very rarely have to supplementary feed. Um, as I mentioned in the, the talk, our grazing ratios are about just over a minimum of just over a hectare per head to five hectares per head year round. So we find that they have enough browse and forage to sustain them and keep them in good health with that. OK, thank you. Thank you. So back to the floor now. There's a question. Yeah, just here. Yep. Hello, uh, Emma Preston from the Donkey Sanctuary. Uh, this is for Jenny. How is your anthelmintic use within the herd affected by concerns about anthelmintic residues in dung on the land um, and the impact that that has on invertebrates? Okay. I, we worm test a lot. Um, I think it's a great tool. I don't think it's 100% brilliant in knowing. I think a lot of people worm, don't worm count after. They don't know what the worm count, the burdens are. I think we need to look at a bigger picture. I feel that we, our horses' worm counts seem to stay quite low. Now, I hope that is because of the plants they're eating, the environment breaking it down, using, you know, the worms getting eaten, the eggs getting eaten. Um, when we do have to worm, and we do, we do do worming, um, I tend to keep them in. I try to keep them the separate. I try not to get it out on the land. And I just think there's a lot more questions need to be asked about how we, we do run it and manage it better, personally. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. We've got a question come in from Sheila Voas. Um, sometimes conservation grazing um, can be seen as an excuse to not meet welfare needs. Wild potentially could be equal to let nature take its course. Are others worried by that thought? I think our horses are quite happy and high welfare. I, I don't think that's an issue. Carol, have you got any comments on that? I think that isn't a concern um, for many people. Um, I think the way we try and run our horses is, yes, we try and give them as natural a life as we can do, but we obviously have to uphold the welfare standards that, and we have a moral obligation to do the best we can for the horses. So if we are required to intervene, we do so in a timely fashion. We have, I think, the benefit of at Wiccan of learning from other people's mistakes um, and where they've got things wrong and being able to avoid those same mistakes as well. Thank you. We've got time for another couple of quick questions. So a quick question from the floor. Gentleman there. Yep. Miles Williamson Noble. I'm typical of a lot of horse owners, I think, with a couple of aged hunters. Um, and just a few acres. Now, I would love to have my paddocks looking like alpine meadows, um, but if I don't top them and spray them, I finish up with a glorious crop of ragwort, nettles, and buttercups. Um, if I ask how to get a wildflower meadow, I'm told to plough it all up, get rid of all the grass, plant the yellow rattle you don't want, and then it'll let last. Is there actually a workable system whereby those of us with limited grazing can actually finish up with more natural grass than this beautiful green sward? No is the easy answer. <laughs> um, it's, you've got to, unfortunately, especially when you've got things like buttercup, it is a sign of a not a very healthy system. So personally, I think I would look to start again for a longer lasting, better outcome. Um, yeah, so that's how I'd go about it. Trying to get rid of buttercups, I think, is, is very hard. And it does mean that your soil isn't very healthy. It's very compacted and there's some issues. So. Thank you. Thank you both, Jenny and Carol. I have to draw that to a conclusion now, so thank you very much for that. We're going to quickly reveal now the results of the second poll. Um, so you can see how often you think the environment should take priority of the horse-human relationship or vice versa. So if we could get the results up. Um, and so the vast majority there, 92% said sometimes, so that there, there needs to be a balance between the environment and that relationship. So 
quite a resounding election result there. Um, now we move to our discussion panel, so you can actually get rid of the amateur presenter, and I'm delighted to, to welcome a professional presenter to the stage, known to all of you, uh, Nick Powell, the sports editor of Sky News. Um, so over to you, and if you could bring your panel with you, and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, I'm going to start by shedding a, a little light on our esteemed uh, panel, three of them here, and one joining us from France, who will no doubt pop up on the screen um, very shortly, and I'll tell you which of them is the long-distance lorry driver, which one is the dodgy holiday companion, who is the rock dancer, and which one went out as a child with their dad on his bakery round. Um, as for me, because I do still... Oh, there is uh, Agatha joining us from um, France. Agatha, good afternoon. Um, people do still ask what I'm doing here, especially those who've seen me do this before. Um, six years ago today, I chaired this panel for the first time, um, Rowley very bravely building on the relationship that we'd established through my coverage of uh, horse racing for Sky News. Um, one week ago, to the hour, I was doing another question and answer session at a school in Dusseldorf in Germany. Um, they asked me if I had a favorite member of the royal family. <laughs> yes, of course, I said, our president. One month ago, I woke up in Bucharest to discover that my car had been incinerated in the Luton Airport car park fire. So you never know what's coming next as Agatha Jekensch uh, could tell you. Um, she's joining us from France, where she was born prematurely. Her parents wanted her born in Poland. She's half Polish, half French. Uh, in her spare time, she is the one who does rock dance. I'm just going to fetch my glasses, because I, I can just about see my notes, but only just. Um, rock dance involves a, a male and female partnership, generally, but in the village where Agatha dances her way to uh, Elvis is very popular, apparently. Uh, they're a bit short of men, so for these purposes, uh, Agatha, Agatha became a man, or to put it differently, a leader rather than a follower. That's what she told me. Um, she had experience doing West Coast swing, so uh, she was suitable for being a leader. She doesn't ride, but she has taken up carriage driving. Your father would have approved, Mum. Um, as a child, she loved the idea of working with horses, but she was told it was too competitive, she couldn't make a career of it, but she went to agricultural college, and now here she is working for the French Institute for Horse Riding, Horse and Riding in Normandy. You never know what's coming next. And that is certainly the case for the family of Ingmar de Vos on the far left as you look. I'll come to his family uh, in a moment. We're fortunate that he's here in person because he travels a lot as the head of the FEI. Uh, he was with our president at the International Olympic Committee in Mumbai last month, and when I spoke to him shortly after that, he was in Chile for the Pan American Games. We might have been calling him Your Excellency if his career plans aged 12 or 13 had come to fruition because he wanted to be a diplomat. Fair to say you need a fair bit of that uh, in the FEI. Uh, but he is a dodgy holiday companion for his family because he tends to get bored after three or four days and he's been known to end family holidays early. So his wife has started booking cruises so he can't <laughs> escape. If you work on your swimming, Ingmar, there might be a solution. Uh, Jenny Fernando um, does more travelling for work than you might expect for a director of finance, but then she only became an accountant to pay for horses. She says she has, and I quote, absolutely no interest in accounting. 
Director of Finance. Uh, so she got out from behind the calculator to head up World Horse Welfare's Environmental Working Group. And when a truck needed driving to Aberdeenshire, she did it herself on her own all the way in one day from Blackpool. She was hoping on that trip to spot her first red squirrel. She's still hoping. <laughs> she does now own a horse, thanks to all that miserable work with figures. Uh, the horse is called Socks, you can guess why. And she does a bit of dressage and uh, a bit of jumping as well. Dave Rendell in the middle there, by contrast, says he is definitely not a rider, but he has, quote, careered across the Mendips completely out of control. Uh, his veterinary work these days is consulting on clinical trials, and the main thing that stops him from watching or playing sport all the time is the 200-acre sheep farm he bought five years ago. Um, he says that was completely stupid, and I'm quoting again here, an absolutely ludicrous thing to do, uh, dooming himself to losing money while getting up at 2 a.m. to care for the lambs. And it was Dave's dad who had a baker, there was a baker, and Dave got out uh, to go with him on his Saturday morning rounds. He did get to test the produce, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is your panel. So, uh, to business, and uh, do keep the questions coming on uh, Slido and in the room. We're going to look at three sections over the hour that we've got, and we'll take questions at the end of, of each bit. We're going to start in the, in the world of sport. We're going to start with uh, Ingmar, and the question is, what other radical ideas, in addition to what we have already, should be considered to enable all levels of horse competition to become more sustainable? Ingmar. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, World Horse Welfare for the invitation, but also for the long-standing partnership uh, we have uh, between you and the FEI. When you talk about uh, radical, uh, I I'm not sure that I like that word, because radical ideas, radical solutions have not always been the most sustainable ones. But uh, I think uh, we have heard already great ideas here and great solutions today. And, and, uh, and, and I think the biggest challenge there is communicating them and is creating the awareness. Because you can have these solutions, but not everybody is aware of them. I can tell you that in general, the sports world, the international sports world, is very much aware of uh, the responsibility that they carry and, and, and how is the society looking at them when it comes to uh, sustainable solutions for the sporting events. And the IOC has also undertaken a lot of initiatives in that uh, direction. The FEI itself, we are uh, one of the earliest signatories of the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Framework back in 2019, and we have been involved since then in fine-tuning uh, this uh, framework. But as we always say, uh, lead by example. So first of all, let me look into our own organization. Uh, thanks to my predecessor, uh, the FEI headquarters back in Switzerland, in Lausanne, uh, have a high level of uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, we are uh, responding to the highest uh, uh, requirements of minergy uh, in Switzerland, so we do not have air conditioning uh, and things like that. Uh, we also look at the travel of our staff. We have uh, more than 100 people working in the FEI with events uh, all over the world and uh, a lot of traveling involved. And I think one of the maybe positive uh, results of the whole COVID uh, crisis was that we all learned to work with uh, video conferences and that we also are looking in reducing our travel and are much more careful also thanks to a reporting system that we have with the United Nations about our carbon footprint, that we are looking at reducing as much as possible uh, the travel of our staff, including myself, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not possible to do that. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to events, and that's of course key, uh, we have more than 4,500 international events in our calendar, uh, so you can imagine that, that it is important to undertake action there as well. And we started already back in 2014, uh, we published our first FEI sustainability handbook for organizers. And we have uh, been working on this uh, uh, for the last years and we published this year the second edition 
uh, of, uh, of this uh, sustainability handbook for event organizers, which is uh, aligning uh, 11 of uh, 17 United Nations sustainability uh, development tools. And I am very grateful for Root because uh, a lot of uh, solutions and, 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 and handbook. Just one more brief point to you, and then I want to bring in Agatha. Just one more brief point, if you would. Yeah, so also in the bidding, uh, we are uh, taking this into consideration when we allocate big championships. These are criteria that we take uh, on board. But the most important thing, I believe, is, is as I mentioned in the beginning, is the awareness. Uh, we need to make people aware of what the solutions are, that there is a need uh, for a, a sustainable uh, approach. Uh, Rory mentioned uh, the Helsinki World Cup uh, final uh, where manure was used for energy production. We pushed this through our uh, digital channels and there was a reach of 720 million people that have seen that. So we are working on that and uh, I believe communication and creating awareness will be key for the success. Thank you. Agatha, ideas, radical or just good ideas? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, please excuse me for not being here with you today and excuse me also for my French or Polish accent, depending on the words I use. And thank you very much for inviting me. So first of all, when speaking about uh, radical uh, solutions, I was interested in transport, for example, and we spoke about transport. And I would like to bring forward some key figures about the carbon footprint of horses. Uh, Indeed, we have studies about uh, the calculation of these greenhouse gas emissions in our institute. And we see that horses are responsible for uh, two tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent uh, tons per head per year. And some of the studies carried out by the Wageningen University for the European Equestrian Federation shows that 90% of the carbon footprint of a sport horse is due to transport only. So it's uh, about 35 tons of carbon dioxide. So the transport is a hotspot and we need to focus on. And for the, for example, I wanted during this panel discussion to suggest one idea of how to uh, program or to uh, have competitions by reducing or even uh, avoid, uh, avoiding the transportation of horses. So please imagine one same competition in different locations at the same time. This competition would have standardized parameters such as the course, the footing of the arena, the time allowed, even the type of the building, for example, indoor mainly that limits the weather conditions. And then pulling the results would create a global international ranking of course, this system is more easily suited to show jumping. But however, is it possible to imagine some variation for other disciplines such as dressage or maybe uh, driving, horse driving? And these competitions, it's known that they would not have the same effect on the public, on the prestige than the previous ones that we know today. But maybe it's the price to pay in order to mitigate this uh, climate change at this level. Because I'm convinced that uh, the Setting an example is the best argument to, to change the habits of people. Then climate, um, climate change mitigation and impacts on the environment are not also um, based on the carbon footprint. It's also the use of resources such as uh, water. And for example, we study in our institute the use of wood plaquettes, uh, wood chips as footing for the arenas. They are known to be uh, to not use uh, water at all. You don't need to water these wood plaquettes, but uh, you cannot jump as high as today. So it's interesting for to preserve horse joints and horse health uh, by using this wood as footing arenas. But you have to make a choice. Do we need to maintain arenas made of water consuming sand all year round to jump one and a half meter once a month? Or can we agree to give up these activities and reinvent competitions that are no longer based on time and height, but on other factors, for example, uh, the style, etc. So these are my two ideas. I would like to know what you think about it. And I hear you. Thanks. Thank you, um, Agatha. I want to bring in uh, Dave and Jenny in a second. But Ingmar, what about the idea of essentially having fewer venues for 
international competition, therefore less travel? Well, first of all, I think uh, we have already uh, developed some of these initiatives uh, online uh, with artificial intelligence, sorry. Uh, but uh, it, it is very complicated to provide a fair uh, level playing field. Uh, you can ask our judges and our legal department about this, but it is complicated. But we are working on these kind of solutions, but it, I believe it will not or it will never replace a, a top international competition. Dave Randall. I, I'm sympathetic to the Ingmar there. I think it's a lovely idea, but I, I struggle to see the events creating the same atmosphere and having the same buzz about them. But clearly, we need to find solutions. I'm afraid I don't have them. Do, Jenny, do we, do we not have to find a way? We, we can all say, yeah, it's going to be too difficult. It's going to spoil things. But haven't we reached the point where we have to accept that maybe things that we've got used to might be spoiled for the benefit of the environment? Uh, yeah, I, I echo a lot of what Agatha says, and actually um, Forest Green Rovers is the world's first carbon neutral football club, and they serve only vegan food to their fans. Uh, so could anybody imagine serving only vegan food to football fans? You'd think it wasn't possible. Um, so when we sit here and think that won't work, I, I would challenge that. Okay, um, let's, um, there's quite a lot of questions come in already. Let's just uh, throw some of these at you, and, and this one is, is for you as well, Jenny. Will World Horse Welfare be producing a sustainability handbook for equestrian organisations? That's from Harriet Laurie. Thank you for the question. We don't have any plans to do so because I wouldn't see that as our role. Um, we can very much be a friend to the industry, but I think that particularly in terms of horse sport, that is for horse sport to lead on themselves. Okay. Um, any questions from the floor? Do... do um, Put your hands up, I was going to go one more I want to ask um, from Slido, and this is from uh, Victoria South, who says, considering uh, anthelmintics and their impact on invertebrate diversity, do panellists agree there must be tighter control on their sale in line with antibiotics, Dave? I think we might come to that in a second. <laughs> Uh, Do you want me to, I can kick off. Okay, all right, let, let, let's, let's, yeah, all right. Um, let's, I don't want to steal your, your thunder from, um, from further on. Question at the, at the back there. Hi, um, my name is Janet Hughes from Agro Pet Insurance. Um, is there any way that you could um, offer an offsetting carbon calculator for people going to the events so they can offset their journeys? which would help and support the events overall. Ingmar? I'm sorry, I didn't really understand the question. Ah. The calculator. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's, that's what we already do with this uh, calculation system that we have. So there, there is already uh, a system like that in place, but it needs, of course, to be further uh, refined. Uh, I can give you the, the example like uh, uh, our world championship organizers in Herning uh, back last year, they, uh, they did a lot uh, in, in that field and uh, are, were measuring uh, the carbon uh, footprint offset and took a lot of measures uh, as a result of that. One of the ones that I want to mention is, for instance, they have 900 volunteers that normally would come every day to the event. Uh, they organized on-site uh, uh, lodgement for these uh, uh, volunteers so that they didn't have to travel every day back and forth to the event. But that was one of the uh, indicators that, that uh, came up uh, when doing uh, these simulations on the uh, carbon footprint. Dave? I, I suppose I'd say we, we don't need to do that necessarily at FEI level. We all have an individual responsibility mm -hmm. to take those measures. And the, the challenges that we face around horse sport are the same as we face in many other industries and in our personal lives around our carbon footprint and our environmental impact. So we shouldn't need leadership to, to mitigate those issues and to offset the damage that we know that we do. Much like Ruth said earlier on, we can all take individual very simple actions and we know what they are. We just need the motivation to do it. So it's, it, there's a, you need the balance, don't you, between top down, trickle down, setting an example, but just people taking responsibility for their own actions? I think so. And it's not just about leadership, it's about providing people with the tools to understand what their carbon footprint is, which can be quite a challenge. Um, 
Agatha, any thoughts to add? You're, you're nodding away in front. Yes, yes. Uh, I would like to um, add that we are working on a footprint calculator for farms, for breeding farms, for example, and it's very difficult for us to create this footprint calculator because the research in horse uh, greenhouse gas emissions are just very new and there are not a lot of um, resources. So we are going with the research at the same speed and we are creating at the same speed the, the resources. So I think it's... Um, uh, it's going to be uh, cr created soon, but just uh, we need research to uh, create these tools. But it's positive. Uh, it's well positive. Um, there's a question for you, Agatha, as well. I'll take another one from the floor in just a second, so let us know if you'd like to ask one. Um, Agatha, Krista Leste Lasser asks, horse transport remains highly dependent on individual or grouped transport by truck. Is there any hope of convincing railways to offer horse cars, horse carriages? It was also one of my questions to the audience because it was one of my uh, idea. Uh, is it possible to reinvent the, the, the trains and the railway transportations to use to, to, to horses? I think it can be done, but you see that today uh, we need trains to transport um, trucks also. So maybe your horses will be on a second time. But if we speak uh, a lot about this and bring forward arguments to uh, decision makers, etc., maybe they will think about it and we would be able to create something together. Dave, your thoughts? Oh, introduce the preliminary phase where you've got to ride to the competition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, questions from the floor? Um, in the middle there. Um, Jessica Ball from Greenwich University. Um, as a student going into the industry, how can I be more sustainable and how can I influence or encourage the industry to be more sustainable to going into competitions? Jenny. I think it's about attitude and behaviour. Um, Rolly talked about how human beings are, are part of a herd and your attitudes and behaviour will affect the attitudes and behaviour of the people around you. So if you can go into your career with that, um, you should have that ripple effect of getting more people interested and, and understanding and, and knowing what they need to do. Ingmar? Yeah, I think it needs to become more and more part of the education and uh, also the education that we give to, to our community, basically. Creating the awareness, we need also to be aware that the perception or the need uh, to, to improve the sustainability of our activities is not the same in all parts of the world, I can tell you. I was very much uh, interested by the intervention from our colleague from Senegal, where we will have the Youth Olympic Games uh, in 2026, but there is already a big debate ongoing on how sustainable these games are going to be. So I think education, creating the awareness with our own community to lead in, in this field and to, to make our sport more sustainable. Can, can I ask you, just, just very briefly, do you feel in the environment that you're in that there is enough emphasis on, on the area you asked about? Um, sorry. We do speak about it in current issues, but I feel like there could be more with universities on bringing forward environmental ways we can help. Like we have university Greenwich groups, but I feel like there could be more influence in that area, especially with people going into the industry as we are the new upcoming people that are coming into the industry. Thank you very much. Um, before I move on, a couple more from the floor. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Sam Austin, I run Ownership just, just, You've got a very good loud voice, but let's make it even louder. <laughs> I'll be even louder now. Um, I run Ownership Syndicates within horse racing, and I wonder whether there might be a uh, something we could look into within all, all um, equine disciplines where perhaps there could be sort of a, a kite mark, a green leaf for those participants who uh, carbon offset um, their journeys, transport, um, get into events. So within, for example, horse racing, one could be allocated uh, a, a green leaf to carry on a jockey's cap or something if you, had, if you, if you as an owner offset those costs to get to the race meeting. And why it would not be obligatory, but perhaps it could be something to try and set the trend and maybe other owners may say, oh, I'm not a part of that, perhaps I should be. Um, and something that people at these events would see and so would, not, would acknowledge that competitor um, is doing their bit. Ingmar, is that realistic and would it help? 
Well, I, I don't know in how far it's realistic, but I think there could be a kind of a recognition for people that do the right thing. And I think we should also do the same with our organizers. Uh, we are working on an, on an organizing, on a categorization system for organizers, and I believe that sustainability should be part of it. And that uh, you could get a green label as an organizer, which I believe, if there is enough awareness and education with our people, they will maybe go more to that type of organizations than the ones that have a, a red flag. Would it make a difference, or is it just something that sounds good? Good question. I'm not sure I'm decided on that myself. I think, you know, it, it brings attention to it, which I think is, is good, uh, and it's good to celebrate success. Okay, um, I'll take one more from the floor if, if there is, oh, go on. <laughs> Top level question. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, it I'm was expecting great things. Oh, Lord. Um, it was more to say that um, a lot of the things that have been suggested and requested, you'll be delighted to know, are going to be announced really, really soon. The industry is working at pace and has been all year, so within the next month, you're probably going to be hearing about kite marks, awards, toolkits. What I would say, don't carbon offset your way out of this problem. Carbon offset is just a consumerism associated with environmental sustainability. We've got to reduce what we do. We've got to improve our um, work on the land. And so I guess I would want to throw back to um, uh, everybody uh, on the panel to say, uh, I know what's being launched. What one thing would you like to see happen in 2024 within the Equine space around environmental sustainability? OK, let's go round the panel. Agatha, let's come to you first. Try and be oh. Brief. Uh, yes, I would like to see people asking for uh, efforts, for asking organizers, for example, of events to make an effort. I think that people w would be the, the the main source of evolution. Okay, um, Dave? I'd like to see restriction on the sale of ecotoxic medicines. Jenny? I'd like to see not one big thing, but lots of small things, more hedges, better grazing, uh, more toolkits and, and help for people out there. Ingmar? I would like to see more awareness uh, in education uh, uh, to make it aware to people what they have to do. Satisfied, Ruth? Yes, <laughs> all written down. Uh, excellent, thank you very much indeed. Let's move on to the second area we want to discuss, um, which I almost leapt into soon, the veterinary area. We're going to start with Dave. <laughs> Among other issues arising from our changing environment, antimicrobial resistance and resistance to horse wormers are regularly talked about. What realistically can vets and horse owners do to meet this big challenge? Well, I've just given away my punchline, but <laughs> I, um, I felt it was too good an opportunity to miss. I, I think the most, or, or firstly, I think the important thing is everyone is aware of the issues, which it's refreshing having been sat through the morning session that most, if not all, of the speakers have mentioned the ecotoxic effects of much of what we do, which, which is really great that there is that level of awareness because most, if not all, of the parasiticides that we use are ecotoxic to the point that there are many groups calling for bans on some of, those, some of those chemicals, more in the small animal space, some veterinary groups as well, and those chemicals have already been banned in agriculture. So it's logical that we should have restriction on their use as well. Like, do people think about the harmful effects of, of fly spray, what that does to other insects in the environment, what that does to their predators? We use ivermectin frequently. It's the most widely used equine wormer. Does everyone appreciate how ecotoxic that is, that it's excreted in manure for in excess of 40 days? It remains toxic in the environment for at least four months. Uh, if, it, if, if contaminated rainwater that's flushed through feces gets into watercourses, it's exceedingly toxic to aquatic life. Just about every river system in the UK you can detect veterinary parasiticides. The Environment Agency did some work recently which identified that 37% of rivers have ecotoxic levels of veterinary parasiticides. Uh, so this really is a huge issue, and, and these issues have only started to come to light in the last few years, and I think awareness needs to be much higher. And hopefully from that, it follows that we all have an individual responsibility to look carefully at how we use these drugs. And that's not just parasiticides, that's also antibacterials, where we use them. We know we get uh, populations of resistant bacteria in the environment that have a detrimental effect to all species, in including our own, wild as well as domesticated. So it's antibacterials and antiparasiticides. So we have to accept that when we use these drugs, 
It is, I'm afraid, a consequence of our inappropriate management of horses. All the conditions that we're treating mostly, not always, but mostly could be avoided by improvements in management practices. So when we use them, that's an admission that our management practices, I'm afraid, are, are failing. So we need to all accept that uh, and ask serious questions when we're using them. But I'm, I'm afraid voluntary actions are probably never going to be enough because it's always too easy to use these drugs. And this, this applies to vets and prescribers as well as users. So we are going to need some kind of restriction if we are serious about preventing the environmental damage of, of these drugs. And that would have other welfare benefits on preventing antimintic resistance as well, which I'm nearly there, Nick, which is a sustainability, <laughs> that is a sustainability issue in itself because the more resistance we get to these drugs, the more frequently we have to use them to have the same effect and we get this downward spiral of ecotoxicity and reducing efficacy, which is, which is no good to, to anyone. So, um, yeah, we, ne we need to really reassess where we are with these drugs. Ingmar, how do you see this from the, 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 the world of elite competition? First of all, I'm not a scientific, uh, uh, but we have, of course, a very good uh, veterinary committee and a list group. Uh, for the moment, these products, they are allowed uh, in, uh, in our competitions. Uh, we did some testing uh, research uh, in the framework of our equine anti-doping and control medication program, but there was not uh, significant use demonstrated uh, by this analysis, but I think for us it's important that horses can be treated because their health is important, but of course it needs to be done in a responsible way. Uh, prevention is much more important uh, in this case, and certainly not overuse of these products. Agatha, what do you make of what you've heard so far? Mm, I would like to say that I'm not an expert for this field, for this domain, but my colleagues work on a tool that allows to predict the, the most risky period of time where the horses can be um, infected. So in order to prepare the horses and prepare the yard and to use the right amount of, uh, of drugs in the right time. So if you want to know more, I can... Uh, you can contact me to know more, but uh, we are trying to do this kind of tools for the farmers and for the horse keepers. Dave, can I just pick you up on one thing you said? You said we need to raise, raise awareness. People always say that stuff. How do you do that? Uh, through, through, through platforms like this, I think it's, this is... This is this mostly preachers and converted, though, isn't it? Yeah, I know, but there's a lot of people here that will have staff that work for them that are a part of in very influential organisations. If we can take these messages about the level of ecotoxicity back to all those organisations and, and spread that word, then I, I think that can be hugely powerful. Jenny, do you, do, you, do you think that the need for action the, and the urgency of it is, is sufficiently understood, sufficiently widely understood? Uh, probably not, uh, and I think that, that Dave is right in terms of um, trying to spread awareness. I do wonder if, if um, Beaver or the BVA, uh, maybe in conjunction with an organisation like Canter, who are looking at uh, wormer resistance, uh, could, could do some sort of campaign, awareness raising campaign, social media areas where you're going to get under the noses uh, of horse owners, because I imagine that when it comes to worming, it, it's the horse owners that we really need to get to, whereas antibiotics, I imagine, are, are far more greatly controlled by vets. Yeah, so I, if, yeah, talking specifically about antimintics, there is a lot of work going on at the moment. Um, and the, the Cantor Initiative, which you talk about, which is an industry-wide initiative to raise awareness and provide best practice guidelines to the industry on how we use these drugs. Uh, and all, that's a relatively recent uh, project that hopefully will come to fruition early next year. So there is an awful lot of work going on around education uh, and awareness. But... Uh, there is that double-edged sword that if you look at the behavioural science, the human behavioural science, unfortunately, it's always going to be easy to administer a wormer than it is to do the diagnostic test, to change our pasture management, to reduce our stocking density, to do all the preventive things that eliminate the need for that wormer. So I, I feel there is going to have to be some level of restriction on prescribing. That's not to say that we should stop the use of these drugs. Clearly, we need, we need to use these drugs. But I would love to see a position whereby antiparasiticides are afforded the same respect as antibacterials, which you can only get and use in conjunction with expert veterinary advice. Uh, at the moment, I just think it's far too easy for those that aren't engaged with either resistance arguments or the ecotoxicity arguments to take the easy option and to use the drugs rather than implementing the appropriate management changes. You talked about, when, when you started, you talked about forcing change on people effectively. What would that look like? 
So I think we need both. We, clear, we, we need education. We need, we need people to understand the reason for change. But I think we also do need to limit access to these drugs through ensuring that they can only be prescribed in conjunction with veterinary advice. That doesn't necessarily mean a vet needs to sell everyone or prescribe everyone individually. But I think it, I would love to see a, a position where every equestrian property has a plan for parasite control, which is which works for that property, because people always want an easy answer for parasite control. How can I do it this year? They just, they just want a quick program. It, it doesn't work like that generically. It has to be specific to the property, because every, every property is different. We've heard about some really diverse management systems and properties today, and they're all going to need a different system of parasite control and a different policy with respect to antimicrobial use. So I would like to see a veterinary policy that's premise specific and within that framework antimintics and antibacterials can then be used but there needs to be some oversight some audit some level of review to ensure that that use is appropriate and is kept to as kept to a minimum okay. there's a, clearly there's a balance isn't it we've got to balance equine welfare with the environment and i think that's where we need expert oversight a quick question coming up more on the on the micro level from um our YouTube comments, and then I'll take some questions from the floor. Focus one to you, uh, Jenny. What strategies would you recommend we pursue to encourage people to learn more and change their behaviour in terms of environmental sustainability? Uh, well, can I, I can only really speak for, for myself, uh, you know, in, in my role in the charity. Um, we put together a working group of people that had an interest uh, and a little bit of knowledge about different things, a bit of farming, um, you know, a bit of a sort of natural habitat creation, etc. But none of us were experts, so we, we had to put in the legwork and do the reading uh, and, and talk to people. Okay, and do you, do you sense amongst the, the, what's the word, the rank and file, the people out there, an understanding of the need for change and a willingness to change. I certainly think that there is a, a growing body of that and, and hearing people like Jenny speak, it's just incredible the things that they're doing at Ash. So there's a lot out there that I, I think would be great that, that could reach more people so that we can understand and learn from each other. Just want to throw that to, to Agatha as well before I take a question from the floor in, in France. Do you sense that there is an, an awareness of the need to change quite urgently? Um. I think so, but it uh, depends on the, the the climate and the environment you are. Uh, that is to say that uh, France has a lot of uh, different uh, environments, pedoclimatic environments. Uh, you have meadows and uh, pastures in uh, Normandy. Then you have uh, the Mediterranean cl climate on the south. So it's important to adapt our uh, arguments and our uh, uh, projects to uh, each type of grasslands you have and each type of horses that grass on the uh, pasture is on the pastures. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Uh, Come near the front here. Uh, hello, thank you. Yeah, Chris Tufnell, Bog Standard Horse Vet and World Horse Welfare Trustee. <laughs> um, I, I'm fascinated what you've got to say about expert um, opinion and bringing in plans on parasite control uh, and I love the idea but uh, and knowing that the people who just grab the wormer off the off the shelf uh, aren't really wanting to spend the money on that sort of thing it sounds to me like there's a, 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 a room for an app here that could have a lot of the variables put into it and with the help of AI could come up with a, a decent plan it might not be your perfect plan but it, it would maybe have a greater um, a greater extent uh, of use in, in the horse population. If, if you thought that was a good idea, who should fund the development of that and who should be, who should be putting that in place? <laughs> oh, oh, God, not another, another app. Um. <laughs> looking nervous. Um, that, Chris, that, far from a bog standard horse vet, but that, that has unfortunately been tried. Um, Jackie Matthews' group, I'm pretty uh, confident, did lead some work on trying to develop an app to, to assess parasite control risk. But it, I just don't think it works, sadly. I wish it did. But there are so many variables to consider that are property-specific. And now that we have resistance to every class of antimintic that we use in horses, and most properties don't know what resistance they have, we don't have all the information we need to, to plug into an app. And as, as good as artificial intelligence is, I don't think 
we're at a position where that can compensate for knowing the property, knowing the management system, having someone that really knows the nuances go through all the variables with the owner of a property. And, and I completely accept that at the moment we, we have a very retail culture around the use of, of antiparasiticides. We expect to be able to go in and buy them over the counter, possibly with a conversation around how they're being used and, and why they're being used, but often not. Um, and so it's hard to move away from that. And I think that's why we do need some kind of push away from that. And the, pro the, the healthcare piece that is veterinary-led doesn't, well, I hope it isn't specific to parasite control. There's, there's a world of opportunity there yeah. around wider in infectious disease control and welfare, uh, where we could have much better oversight and input onto equestrian properties, okay. which would help with social license. Okay. Sorry, I thought you were endorsing me, not chastising uh, no, I'm, you. I'm, I'm, I'm not just, I, I wouldn't dream of chastising you. Uh, I'm just shutting you up. Um, <laughs> um, any more from the floor before I move on to the, or lots more from the floor. Um, lady there in the middle. Sorry about this, far away from a microphone as I could possibly have chosen. Sorry about that. How are you at catching microphones, madam? Uh, Joe White from Human Behaviour Change for Life. I'm really grateful. That it's very pleasing to hear behavioural science being talked about. And I think it's great that we're, we're talking about this subject in terms of sustainability. Um, in relation to behavioural science, there's a lot of talk around the, the fact that knowledge, doesn't, knowledge and awareness don't necessarily lead to behavioural action. Do the panel have any thoughts about more of an approach around social support and actually how you can o help owners to develop plans and initiatives themselves so that they actually have the, the confidence and the skills? Because we talk about education, but we also need to talk about action in terms of how people can develop those skills to do this in reality. Dave, you're nodding sagely. Uh, yeah, well, I defer to Jo, because she's a behavioural scientist, but I've worked with some of her colleagues, and I think there is a huge knowledge and tension gap around the use of parasiticides. Lots of owners use diagnostics, lots of owners profess to know about how they use those diagnostics and how that informs their behaviour. But when we look at what they actually do, it doesn't align with current best practice, which is a massive, a massive problem. Um, so the Cantor Group are doing a lot of work at the moment around education and best practice guidelines. Beaver are trying to upskill um, veterinary surgeons, already 85% of equine vets will offer uh, plans around parasite control. So the level of knowledge there is, is good, but can always be better. So Beaver are developing toolkits at the moment, which will come out around the same time as the Cantor program. So hopefully everything is all joined up. So we're trying, but there's always a ton more to do. OK, I'll take two, two more on this if we're quick, one more if we're not quick. Um, lady there in the middle and then front row here. Hi, um, Phoebe Sussman from the University of Bristol. Um, obviously, the control of veterinary medicines varies greatly depending on which country you're in. And I was just wondering how we can encourage different countries to uh, protect and use veterinary medicines more sustainably and responsibly. Agatha Rajeng. Oh, I think it's a more strategic, even political point uh, uh, of view. But um, I'm thinking about all of the European Federation. I speak about uh, Europe, for example. Uh, for example, the European Host Network, which aim is to centralize all of the uh, knowledge uh, and uh, the, the needs of all of the countries, uh, especially, for example, of the green assets, but also for this um, use of uh, antimentics. And maybe these organizations that are at the European level, it's their responsibility to bring forward this kind of subject. And I think they are doing this Thank today. You. And, a, and a, a quick final question on, the, on, on this part of it from the front row. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, Ash Rescue Center. Um, just on the same theme that the lady was just mentioning, um, I spent a lot of time in Denmark, and Denmark have actually banned the sale. It has to be through veterinary um, support, so, you know, worm counts is the only opportunity for you to buy wormers. Can the UK not follow that same theme? Dave? Yeah, the U yes, the UK could. That would obviously require legislative change, um, which is not easy. Um, Potentially, the Danish system goes a bit too far. It doesn't allow enough freedom to operate. That is a criticism of that system. Um, I still think it would be better than the current status quo in the UK, where it's too free and easy. Uh, but I think there is a happy medium that we could come to. But it, it, yeah, Scandinavia, all the Scandinavian countries have gone down that route. Ireland is going down that route as well. That, that is the direction of travel. The UK is a little bit behind. OK, thank you. Let's move on to uh, our final 
subject area, which is uh, the leisure area. How can yards and horse owners best care for their horses and manage the land they graze in a way that maximizes environmental sustainability? Agatha. Thanks. So we know that, uh, and we saw that equines and horse uh, keepers uh, present green assets, environmental more positive contributions. The maintaining grassland is important for carbon storage and biodiversity, even on areas where crops are not or uh, cannot be planted. And I'm convinced that the horse industry can find a balance between uh, the positive and the negative uh, impacts on the environment and can achieve sustainability. It needs to get closer to the agricultural sector and society and needs to communicate communicate more about the green assets of it uh, uh, of its green assets and before i spoke a lot about transport and the emissions of co2 so the carbon dioxide but i want to focus now on other greenhouse gases uh, that are um, emitted in yards and in pastures and from the manual management which are which are the nitrous oxide and methane and some studies show that uh, the paddocks can be a significant but local sources for these gases, and the emissions could even be higher than in the case of a manual storage. So to better manage these paddocks, especially when the density of the animals is quite high, it's important to uh, avoid the compaction of the soil, because the more compacted the soil is, the less air it allows to pass through, it, so it generates more greenhouse gases. And then you need to spread out the manure to avoid areas of over concentration of nitrogen because nitrogen is the main um, source of uh, the emissions of N2O, so of the nitrogen uh, oxides. So it can be done by moving the points of interest such as the hay or the water, but also collecting the waste to avoid polluting the surrounding waterways. And then to avoid and limit the nitrogen runoff, it is important to keep a permanent vegetation uh, on the grasslands and to keep agroecological infrastructures, such as uh, hedgerows. And we spoke about it uh, just before. And it helps the maintenance of biodiversity, which is an another important aspect of sustainability. And last but not least, the grasslands are a carbon storage. So it's very important to keep grasslands so a better management of grasslands contributes to store the carbon that is emitted by other human activities. And I think this is the main green assets of uh, equines and of grasslands. Thank you, Agatha. Jenny? I think for me, it's about understanding what you have um, in terms of your land. You know, where is it situated in the country? What kind of weather do you experience? Uh, is it flat or hilly? Do you have particular issues with ground getting too wet or too dry? What sort of wildlife do you have on site? Once you understand that, you can think about simple changes that you can make that, that play into helping you manage those things. So we now know from looking at what wildlife we've got on the farm um, and our Aberdeenshire farm that we've got a really rare type of moth that needs birch trees to thrive. So we can focus our efforts on making sure that we're, we're protecting and cultivating that habitat specifically for that purpose. I think, think about what your horses need. You know, horses need friends, freedom and forage. So what things can you do that's gonna have an impact positively there as well? Plant some hedging to create browsing interests and, and shelter from the wind um, that will help keep your soil together better as well. Um, also think about things that, that could help you. Um, you know, if you have a particular issue maybe with water source, can you, can you try rainwater capture that will help you to manage that? Uh, can you weave things into your existing maintenance programs in terms of your, your properties, whereby you're then adding extra insulation or, or, or you know, making your buildings more thermally efficient just during the normal course of your maintenance routines? Um, not all of us have acres of land that we have to manage. I don't. I, my horse is kept on livery, so I don't have any direct input into the land management itself. But I can still make sure that I don't leave buckets overflowing with water, that I worm responsibly, uh, and that I recycle uh, feed packaging wherever I can, that I don't overbuy tools that I can share with others. And if you are lucky enough to have um, large, significant amounts of land um, to work with, then you could think a little bit more radically, maybe about rainwater capture. We're doing that at our Norfolk farm in terms of capturing the rainwater and using it to flush the toilets in the visitor centre. Sorry, why is that radical? Isn't that obvious? 
<laughs> well, it, it, it can be expensive, I think. It, it very much depends on people's individual circumstances, what you can afford, what you have space to do, what your horses need. So it's not sort of one answer. It's about looking what you've got mm. and then thinking, what simple things can I do that's going to work for me and work for my horses, given the circumstances? And if you're not sure where to start, I will pass on the advice that Ruth Dancer gave to me, which is just look at one or two simple projects that others have done before you that's going to work for you and start from there. Thank you. Good to see Socks, the horse, getting a, getting a, a mention. Ingmar, do, do the elite yards give enough importance to this? And, and if they don't, what can we do about it? Oh, I, think, I think it's a, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, elite sports, uh, they, they see many times their whole... Uh, infrastructure also as a kind of a sales argument. And when we look uh, at the pictures we saw in the, your presentation of the very nice fences and uh, the haze and everything and the nice uh, gazon, uh, that's also in many cases for these professional and commercial stables a sales argument. It needs to look pretty. Uh, and the vision varies in the world. I mean, when you go to China and you go to the equestrian facilities there, they are almost <laughs> copy-pasted from what they see in the, in the nice uh, places here. So I think uh, that they need to uh, diversify, and I don't think they are really aware of that. Uh, now, in Belgium, we have a program that says May month you don't cut your grass in order to allow flowers and bees and whatever. I think we need maybe to launch a, a similar project program with, uh, with also uh, the high-level uh, infrastructures to make them aware that this is also becoming part of uh, a positive message rather than having the very nice, uh, clean uh, environment. So I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done there. Dave? I'm afraid I have more questions than answers on this. And I feel... Far away. Far away. <laughs> well, I feel this acutely at home as well because we have a small area of land for the horses uh, and it is a biodiversity desert. And then around that, where we've got sheep, we can implement lots of measures to try and improve the biodiversity, which is financially supported, that helps. But I can't work out how we limit weight gain, which, let's face it, most of us are trying to do in our leisure horses, with having the amazing pastures that Jenny was showing earlier. I, I found that really profound. But I, I don't know how you prevent obesity and laminitis in that situation with horses that are prone to that. And I guess that's one of the ironies of this, is we're talking about sustainability, but most of us are feeding our horses far too much and importing tons of concentrated feed to feed what they don't need. But I don't... Yeah, how can I have a, turn my horses out onto amazing meadows and not allow them to go down with laminitis? That's what I can't work out. Let's, let's give Jenny a microphone. Um, so we actually don't really suffer very badly with laminitis at all. Obviously, we're dealing with older horses, and we've got a few that have come in that have had terrible laminitis most of their lives. We strip feed very carefully. Uh, they have a huge diversity of plants to eat. I think that is a major factor. And we take away a lot of their stress. So I think laminitis is a huge stress thing. Stress plants, stress soils, it causes a stress in the body. It causes illness. Um, and as for getting too fat, I. We don't seem to have a problem with that either. I think it's just that we don't have ryegrass, we don't have lots of fattening food, we just have a variety of different things. So. OK, um, thank you for that. Um, we've got about four and a quarter minutes left. I'm kept on a very tight rein, um, to use the right um, phrase by um, Rodi. I'm going to ask all the panellists to give me just one closing thought in a second, but I'll take a few more um, questions from the floor. There's, there's one just three quarters of the way back there on this side. Thank you very much. Hi, Jeanette, Jeanette Allen from the Horse Trust. Um, this isn't so much for the panel as maybe the conference chair and other parliamentarians in the room. So 10 years ago, Your Royal Highness thankfully came and reopened our lovely site, um, which is covered in roofs and has lots of sunlight, but it's also in an ANOB, and it's in the curtilage of a listed building, and we can't put any solar panels up. So we've talked about balance and compromise. How far is this country willing to go for balance and compromise okay. versus NIMBY. OK, um, we have an MP. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that fortunate? Go on, Neil. Cheers, Nick. Thank you for that one. Um, I, you're pushing an open door with me on that one. I, I think um, 
in terms of how we look after the environment and energy security, solar panels are great. You've got to have this, the right solar panels in the right place, and there are plenty of agricultural buildings up and down the land that could have solar panels on them. And I feel very strong. I've spoken in Parliament about this many times as well. We shouldn't be taking good quality food-producing land out of the equation in a food security crisis as well. You've got to put those panels in the right place, and Roofs is a very good place to start. Thank you. Um, Neil, probably one, time for one more on the, on the floor and then 20-second um, summaries from our panellists at the back there, sir. Simon Daniels from the Royal Agricultural University. I just wanted to add to the, some of the points from the panel that most horse owners don't really think enough about their pasture. Good pasture management can provide huge amounts of energy. Um, we can make the sward more diverse, to pick up on Dave's point, actually to have grasses that are less palatable, that are lower in water-soluble carbohydrate to try and reduce the, the risk of laminitis. And if we have the right sward mixture and we put in the right legumes, it helps to feed our soil. So our land is a huge resource and often we don't look after it well enough. And sometimes we don't look after it well enough because we're too scared of laminitis. Okay, so thank, thank there's you. a whole education piece there. Thank, thank you very much. Feel free to comment on that if you'd, if you'd like to with your, your closing remarks. Agatha, let me start with you. Just 20 seconds or so. Thought to leave us with. Uh, 30 seconds. So if you want to help us with research, feel free to contact us because raising awareness by working with the research help us to move forward together and we can do it together do together great things. So feel free to contact the, the research institute near you to contribute to the research if you want. Thank you. Agatha Jenny? I think for me it's the idea of one welfare that what, what's good for the environment is good for our horses and it's generally good for us too. Thank you. Ingmar? Sustainability uh, is really key for uh, the survival of our equine industry and sport, uh, but I think we also need to be optimistic because we have a lot of youth uh, that is involved and the youth is key to here because I think if there is one group of people that understands and that is fully aware of the challenges that we are facing, then it's the youth. Thank you very much. Dave? Um, I would ask everyone next time they use an anti minte or anti-parasite treatment or antibacterial agent to feel a little pang of guilt at the fact they're using it <laughs> and to question what they could do differently to avoid using it again. Thank you very much. I'd like Ingmar ending with a, a note of optimism. Let me add to that by saying, going back to timings, six weeks today, the nights start getting longer, getting lighter again. <laughs> look, let's look forward to that. Um, Ingmar de Vos, uh, Jenny, Dave, Agatha, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much, Nick, and your fantastic panel for that trot, canter, and then gallop through a wide range of, of topics. I was hoping to relax for that hour. I wasn't fully expecting a question to come back to me, but uh, thanks all the same. Um, so carrying on now, um, remember to keep the conversation going on um, Twitter or X. I have to get it right, otherwise Elon Musk will tell me off. Um, we'd like now to pose one final question to our audience, um, and we're going to try and form a word cloud that Rolly's going to reveal. Um, so what three words summarize the relationship between horses and the environment? So what three words summarize the relationship between horses and the environment. So please give one answer, a maximum of three words, and we'll create that word cloud that uh, Rolly will reveal later. While you're considering that, we have the great pleasure of hearing the perspective of World Horse Welfare's president on the issues we have been exploring today. Um, Your Royal Highness, thank you for all that you do for promoting equine health and welfare for the entire equestrian sector. Thank you. You are a true champion of the horse, and it gives me great pleasure and a privilege and honour to welcome Your Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, to the stage. Um, thank you for that in introduction. I don't think I was at a broader perspective, but that's how I started. Oh, and by the way, um, putting solar panels on the roofs of buildings you already have, not as easy as it sounds. We were told we'd have to rebuild the roof 
of the whole school in order to be able to do that. You won't be surprised to hear it hasn't happened yet. Um, these things do sometimes sound simple, and at the end of the day, they are more complicated. But first of all, can I say to World Horse Welfare, uh, what an exceptional range of talks we've had today. And to those who took part, thank you so much for doing that. This is a, uh, a question, it says it's about horses in terms of their impact uh, and friend or foe, but of course it is about humans really, um, because the horses could probably manage to be environmentally friendly if left to their own devices, um, less so when they've got something to do with humans. Um, we need to make absolutely sure we do understand um, the horses place in the environment and our ability to support them be as natural as possible while we enjoy their presence uh, and the different ways in which we relate to them. And that that's, is a more difficult equation because probably no, there are very few people who start from the same point or indeed with the same experience anymore in terms of what that means. And we can look at all sorts of things that you have already mentioned, uh, but particularly the built environment around horses, uh, the waste that is produced by keeping them and using them and what goes with them and the materials that we use. That's probably the, the, the human, biggest human impact is, is how that takes up, alters the relationship um, with where they live. And all the things we could do slightly better, uh, use of water, the ability to collect water. Um, actually, we do that at home. I'm, I'm not wholly convinced that she uses that water very much because I see it overflowing regularly. But it, it does help. But it means you've got to put it in a number of different places. But I had a question, one or two questions. The impacts on you know, the, the way in which we look after horses. Um, it is fundamentally about scale, isn't it? If you have a couple of horses in a, and you've only got a small area, your impact is going to be considerably less. It can be um, more varied. Uh, you have direct control. And if I was going to simplify what you've been talking about, and I think all our speakers touched on a very interesting range of things that you can do to make a difference, um, not least of all soil stress on that basis in space and how we can try and uh, not carbon offsets, you're so right, unless a carbon offset has a very specific end purpose, don't go there because um, you've no idea what it's doing. Those, all of these things are down to what I call scale problems and I think it's possibly an issue that I've come across literally everywhere. There is absolutely no good idea which cannot be destroyed by scale. And humans have an unhappy knack of coming up with a really good idea and then making it really efficient at a scale which it will never be able to be supported by and certainly not sustainably so. So somewhere along the line, we have to draw lines about what, is, what the Earth can manage what the, our, our local in, environments can manage. And it, all the other bits about being efficient can equally only be done at a certain scale because it doesn't uh, overcome the issues of scale. Uh, that would be true of human population or indeed any other population. And that's true of having um, uh, grazing species that we put in place to help us can, with certain issues but they have to be controlled because their scale is going to be just as much of a problem if we just entirely leave them to their own devices and look after them so well that their natural numbers will just keep on going up, uh, which I'm afraid we're very good at. Um, but the control issue, not so popular. The scale is probably everything that we've talked about and the impact people have already made, which I'm always delighted to see because they have sorted it through and they've come up with varieties, um, varieties of ways of doing things which really make a difference. Um, the virtuous circle of traditional knowledge and what we can do to make best use of that. So my other aspect of that is possibly to remind ourselves, and this goes back to education, uh, this 
education and knowledge of horses didn't start uh, with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people have been using horses for a very long time, and they fundamentally knew how to look after them, and in a way that they used them. But it, its intensity and the scale of which we've started to use them has made a huge impact. We learnt a lot. Some of it wasn't perfect, but we did learn a lot. Some of that knowledge is going to remain entirely relevant today, just as relevant as it's always been. Maybe we didn't know why it was good practice. It wasn't perhaps obvious, we couldn't prove it. But that knowledge is still uh, worthwhile and valuable. And it's understanding where the value in, in our historical knowledge is, still sits, but that we must try and um, retain. We, there are all sorts of things about the past that probably were of benefit. And what we fed animals on and what we kept them on is one of those things. I've just said to one or two people, we, when we moved to Gloucestershire, there was a field that was called Sanfoin. None of us knew what it meant. We do now, because we've done a bit of research into local um, species that would do better uh, to help the soil. Sanfoin was grown widely, both in, in the Cotswolds and, funnily enough, in East Anglia, as a horse feed, as an animal feed. We've forgotten about it. It definitely had benefits, not least of all, because I suspect you didn't get laminitis from it. But those sort of mixtures, those sort of plants have been forgotten, and we're not using them appropriately. Monoculture, it doesn't matter whether it's in agriculture or in horse keep, grass keep. Monoculture is fundamentally bad news. Variety is what makes um, things work better, because animals pick and choose when they were as a pastoralists, as in Senegal, they would have discovered. They range, they pick, and they choose. It depends on the time of year. Actually, even humans used to do that, but that was over 2,000 years ago. Um, which underlies a slightly different problem, which I suspect is key to our ability to work towards more sustainable uh, relationship with the environment and with horses is that practically everything we know makes a difference will take more time. It will be less convenient. And practically all of the decisions we've made on scale and efficiency are based on taking less time and being more convenient. So if I'm summing up, it's a very oversimplistic um, overall view, but scale is fundamentally something that we have to manage better because it can always destroy even the best of ideas. But we also have to be aware that if we want to make a difference, it will take more time. We have to be prepared to give more time. And that keeping horses is not a convenient hobby. <laughs> Shall I leave it at that? <laughs> Thank you for that, ma'am. It's always a privilege to hear your insightful perspective. Now I'd like to ask to come to the stage World Horse Welfare Chief Executive Rolly Owers back on stage for a quick summing up. Neil, thank you. Our president has summed up already. I, 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 what I do say is that World Horse Welfare, is, but one of our mantras recently is try to put more of the world into World Horse Welfare. So I'm delighted to be told by the team, and this is probably not a complete um, reflection of who's watching in, but for outside the UK, we also have France, Romania, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, Borneo, Kenya, Canada, Brazil, Australia, and hopefully many others. So I think the idea that we learned from the pandemic that you really can do a truly hybrid event is really beginning to fruition and I hope that number of countries will grow in the year ahead because we have had such a rich sort of um, tapestry of discussions and ideas for us all to take away. Now I think we do have the word cloud um, which I forgot last year um, and I can't really see that. So natural symbiotic natural environment essential opportunity. So yeah, the, 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 some of the key words, yeah, other words like complex um, and the importance 
of education. So we'll certainly take that away, and it's still being voted on. So if you haven't done already, then please do. I think, just to pick up on what our president said, I think there's been an extraordinary interconnectivity between so much of what has been discussed today with all of these issues. And I think we know that out there, there is um, a really complicated, you know, do, 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 how the world works, how the environment works is really complicated, and the causes of climate change are not that simple. But as Ruth started us off with, they, you know, some of the small steps we can take around considering our, how much greenhouse gases we're uh, um, providing, how much we're conserving water use, how much we're looking at our overall resource use and how we're managing waste and how we're managing our land and improving biodiversity. There are small steps, and you've heard so much advice today, that really can take us forward to be good land managers as well as being good horse managers. And two final thoughts. One, just a, a variation of Jenny's quote earlier. We haven't inherited the equestrian sector from our predecessors. We've borrowed it from our successors. And whilst you're dwelling on that, and when you go out that door and you leave us today, above all else, be more Blue Peter. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I think, I think Ruth Rowley's just snaffled your Blue Peter badge, I'm afraid. So thank you, Rowley. Thank you, everyone, for attending here in the venue, virtually, right across the world. I'd warrant that the people in Australia probably didn't have coffee in the coffee break. They might have had a glass of amber nectar. Um, but with special thanks to our presenters, both here and virtually as well, a very special thank you to uh, Your Royal Highness for being with us and, and giving us those insightful comments at the end. We've covered a lot of ground today, and I hope you agree that there is so much we need to consider about horses and the environment, how we are impacting it, but also how much we can do to improve it and how to become more sustainable while cultivating that vital horse-human relationship. I'd like once again to thank our generous sponsor, the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust, for making today possible and for the support of the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and Equine Register. This now closes our virtual hybrid conference and we wish you a good rest of the day. For guests here in London, we'd like to invite you to stay for lunch. Thank you so much again for attending and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.